Is that good enough? All right. Tell me when I'm ready. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third installment of the 2022 George W. Crockett, Jr. Community Law School. My name is Chewy Carrega. I have the pleasure of serving as general counsel for the Detroit branch of the NAACP. And I want to start by just talking to you a little bit about what the George W. Crockett Law School is all about. First of all, it's part of an overall initiative started by the Detroit branch, which is called the Thurgood Marshall Ruth Bader Ginsburg Legal Initiative. That's a process where we are very involved in following in the giant footsteps Supreme Court Justices Thurgood Marshall and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Bader Ginsburg. Thurgood Marshall, as you know, was the first African-American justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Uh, he had worked diligently over the years for the NAACP as an advocate for human and civil rights within the United States and served many, many, many years as the single African-American justice on the Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was also an associate member of the Supreme Court of the United States. She was the first Jewish woman to serve in the history of the Supreme Court. And just as Thurgood Marshall, she was a forerunner in the movement for civil rights in the United States. She championed all sorts of causes that had to do with women's rights. She was one of only nine women entering Harvard Law School when she entered there. In a class out of 500, there were only nine women. So she's been a stellar champion of civil rights, and we honor her and we honor Thurgood Marshall by naming the initiative after them. Now, within that initiative is the George W. Crockett Community Law School. And this school is put together every year with the intention of getting folks to understand what the legal system and the law is all about. So how do we do that? We bring people in front of you, experts, judges, persons who know what they're talking about, to present to you ideas facts, and the law in order to try and break it down and make it understandable for the average person. So today we have a lineup that's consistent with that very general idea. Um, we have today, in fact, I'm going to start off talking about the federal court system, and then we're going to have Judge Mark Random from the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the Eastern District of Michigan come before you and talk about bankruptcy. It is a specialized area, and I hope that you listen very carefully to his presentation because it affects many, many lives, in including those who have never filed or even contemplated bankruptcy. We're going to have a presentation by Attorney Kalila Spencer one of the brightest young attorneys in the state of Michigan, who will come before you and talk about the right to choose a constitutional amendment that's pending before the voters for this November. Proposal three, proposal two, I'm sorry. And then our own second vice president of the Detroit branch NAACP, Kevin Tolbert, will chair a panel that will be addressing reproductive rights. And we're going to have numerous persons from both sides of the aisle that are going to lay out their positions and then talk to you and answer your questions on what you might have about reproductive rights. So let's get going, if you don't mind. 
and let's get right into it. I'm here this morning to talk to you about the federal court system. And before I actually get into the system itself, I'd really like to talk just a little bit about how the federal judiciary came into existence. As we all know, from 1781 to 1789, the Articles of Confederation were in effect after the independence of the United States from Britain. And in 1787, the Conti Continental Congress uh, convened and ultimately created the Constitution of the United States. Now that was ratified in June of 1788. So for the past 234 years, we've been operating under the Constitution of the United States as we know it. That Constitution really lays out all of the supreme laws of the United States. And one of them, one part of the Constitution is Article Three. That article has to do with the federal judiciary, which was created by the Constitution. And let me just read some of that, which is provided. The judicial power of the United States shall be invested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. What does that mean? That means that independent of Congress and based upon the Constitution of the United States, there is a Supreme Court. That's important because we often hear discussions about Supreme Court decisions and folks don't like Supreme Court decisions. Most recently, the decision that struck down Roe v. Wade. And sometimes you hear people say, well, why don't Congress spank the Supreme Court, so to speak, and tell them they can't do that? That ain't right. But the fact of the matter is the Supreme Court is created by the Constitution so that Congress cannot supervise the Supreme Court. You you've all remember from your civics days in school about the balances of power. You got the judiciary, you got the executive, and you got the legislative branches of the government. The Supreme Court is, in fact, the judicial branch of the government. However, Congress can and has established courts that are inferior to the Supreme Court. So we have on the screen the Supreme Court has nine justices. There's been a lot of talk lately about increasing that number to 12, but as we speak, there are nine justices on the Supreme Court. Since the court is an equal branch of government, the first question we come to is, well, how do these nine justices become a Supreme Court justice? The fact of the matter is, there's a little wiggle room there with the executive because the President of the United States gets to nominate justices, persons to serve on the Supreme Court. And you may remember when President Obama was in office and he nominated Merritt Garland to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. That nomination then goes to the United States Senate. And the United States Senate is supposed to act upon that nomination. But you might recall that the Senate refused to act upon the nomination of, of uh, nominee Garland. And as a result of that, his nomination never got a hearing. That's because no nominee can become a justice of the Supreme Court, either chief or associate, without the consent of the Senate. So for a period of time, 
there was an opening. And you may recall that when President Trump was elected, those openings were filled because President Trump was able to nominate a nominee, a person, and then have their nominee taken up, three of them as a matter of fact, um, and, and fill the vacancies on the Supreme Court. So Supreme Court justices are nominated by the president. That nomination then goes before the Senate under its rules. And if, a, if confirmed by the Senate, then a person becomes a justice of the Supreme Court. You've heard many times it say, well, Supreme Court justices, and in fact, all federal judges serve for life. That's not quite true. That's not quite accurate. Because in Article Three, Section 1 of the Constitution of the United States, it says the judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior. So what does that mean, good behavior? It's been interpreted to mean for life, but it, it isn't for life. Um, judges of the federal judiciary can be impeached the same way presidents, vice presidents, and other members of the government can be impeached. In other words, the House of Representatives may draft articles of impeachment of a judge, a federal judge, because the sufficient number of members of the House think that the judge is not acting in good behavior. And if the House drafts and passes articles of impeachment of a federal judge, that judge then has a hearing before the Senate. Now, you may remember that President Trump was twice impeached by the House of Representatives. Twice he had a hearing in front of the Senate of the United States. Twice the Senate declined to convict him of the issues, the matters that were set forth in the Articles of Impeachment. That same process is what a federal judge would go through, Article Three judge, if impeached, and that it has happened, by the way. It has happened where judges have been removed from the bench uh, under articles of impeachment. Some have voluntarily resigned as a result of the articles, but others have been convicted. So it's not a lifetime job. It is a job that they can continue to hold during good behavior. What's good behavior? goods and as a beholder. So there you go. Um, the other thing about that's interesting about Article One, uh, Article 3, Section 1, is that it establishes in the Constitution that uh, judges shall receive for their services compensation which shall not be diminished in continuing in continuance in office. In other words, as long as they're in office, you can't cut their pay. Now, I found that interesting because I'm an old union guy, and we've had to go to the bargaining table over and over again talk about members giving concessions to employers. Well, somebody did a pretty good job of lobbying, I think, for the federal judges. Because no matter how, how, how unbalanced the federal budget gets, you can't cut their pay. That being said, we talked about how a federal judge is selected because that was that process was made part of the law in the Judiciary Act of 1789, and every since then that's how we've been electing federal judges. Um, that same Judiciary Act of 1789 established what the Constitution called the inferior courts. These are courts that can be affected by Congress. So you see where the Supreme Court hears appeals from 12 circuit courts appeal and 
Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. So there are actually 13 circuits. There are also a Court of Military Appeals from which the Supreme Court hears appeals and the U Supreme Court of the United States can also hear appeals from the highest courts of every state and territory in the United States. It really is a Supreme Court. Now, how do they hear these appeals? They don't have to hear these appeals. They hear the ones that they believe are important enough for the jurisprudence of the United States to need a hearing uh, in front of the Supreme Court. But it's also interesting that in the Articles of Incorporation, the uh, Articles of the Constitution, pardon me, the limitations on the Supreme Court were not enumerated. So generally speaking, in, in the Supreme Court of the United States, it's generally thought of that they would be deciding questions of constitutionality of a law. Roe versus Wade, for instance, you may remember when the decision of the Supreme Court came out, and I'm paraphrasing, this is very general, I'm not an expert on the subject, so don't hold me to it, but the court said, there's nothing in the Constitution that guarantees the right that we've been living under for the last 50 years. So the constitutionality of Roe versus Wade was what was addressed by the Supreme Court not the practicality of the law, but its constitutionality and whether it had a constitutional basis. So most of the time when you, when you, when you see a Supreme Court decision, it ought to be about whether a law is constitutional or not. Now, we then come down to the Circuit Courts of Appeals. Again, there's, there seated the same way as a Supreme Court justice. In other words, the president gets to nominate persons to be on the Circuit Court of Appeals. And that nomination then goes to the United States Senate for an up or down vote, presumably for an up or down vote. And uh, if it's up, then they become uh, judges of the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals, and let me just take them one at a time. The Court of Appeals, the 12 circuits we're talking about, hear appeals from the federal district courts. Now, a federal district court may be what you're most familiar with because we have a federal district court within a st stone's throw of this building where we're sitting today. It's right here in downtown Detroit. It sits on Ford and Lafayette and that big structure there. Throughout the United States, there are 94 U.S. district courts. In other words, all over the country. But there are also U.S. district courts in the Virgin Islands, in Northern Mariana, and in Guam, which are territories of the United States. District courts are really considered the trial courts, the courts of what, what I would use terminology, original jurisdiction. For federal claims, for claims that are removed to the federal court by diverse citizens who have a dispute, they go to the United States District Court. If you don't like the decision of the District Court, you then go to the Court of Appeals. In Michigan, the Court of Appeals is in a circuit called the Sixth Circuit. Generally, it has um, Kentucky, Ohio, Michigan, well, I can't remember the others just right now, but Tennessee. Tennessee is the other. Um, and any district court decisions that come out of those states will go to the Sixth Circuit. If you don't like the decision of the Sixth Circuit, you can ask the Supreme Court, will they hear your case? 
and they have the right to say yes or no. Um, Court of Military Appeals, that's just what it says. There are military reviews that are handled outside of the district courts. And those are reviews from the armed forces. You know, you've, you've seen the movies where people have been court-martialed. They get their stripes ripped off or their whatever, and then they ha they have they, they're entitled to a trial. Well, again, everybody doesn't have to agree with the uh, outcome of the tribunal, the reviewing authority, and so they can take their reviews to the Court of Military Appeals, and from there they can go to the Supreme Court if the Supreme Court accepts their case. And then we have the specialty courts, and I didn't list them all, but just a few. The United States Tax Court, the United States Court of Claims, the U.S. Court of Veterans Appeals, and then U.S. Court for International Appeals. Those are very highly specialized courts. Um, in those courts, you know, you get a trial just like anywhere else, and if you don't like the outcome of that, you can, uh, you can appeal to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit because those judges really are specialists in, in the areas that where they handle matters. Now, there are other matters that I haven't mentioned here. For instance, there are other matters I haven't mentioned here, and um, they have to do with federal appeals that would go to the Federal Court of Appeals for resolution, and then maybe to the U.S. Supreme Court. You'll see on the chart that we have on the screen, there is one other court. I'm not going to talk a great deal about that court because we have an expert here this morning to talk in great detail about what that court does. That's the United States Bankruptcy Court. Those courts, those judges in those courts are different. They're appointed judges. Um, they are not, well, they're not Article Three judges, let me put it that way. Um, a bankruptcy judge will serve, is, is eligible to serve two 14-year terms. 28 years, that's a long time. Um, but unlike the Article Three judges, they don't have the right to stay on the bench so long as they behave. For 28 years, they're gone. So that's my overview of the federal judiciary. And I want to get right into the bankruptcy question because I think that's a logical area for us to follow. So let me introduce to you our speaker on that subject this morning. Any questions? I'm sorry, I didn't know what that symbol meant. Question. Are there any questions about what I've spoken about this morning? If there are not, I'd like to introduce you to the Honorable Mark A. Randon. He has served as a bankruptcy judge for the Eastern District of Michigan since April 2014. Before his appointment, he served as the United States Magistrate. Maybe I ought to back up a little bit because I didn't mention magistrates. Magistrates are judicial officers as well as the judges themselves. And many times you will find that a magistrate will do some of the functions of a judge, uh, but they get siphoned off, so to speak, so that a magistrate can take care of some of the uh, issues that a judge is authorized to take care of, but can pass off, so to speak, to a magistrate. For instance, uh, arraignments, conferences, things of that nature. So Judge Random served as a magistrate judge of the United States 
before becoming a bankruptcy judge. He has also served as a judge, judge of the 36th District Court in Detroit. Those of you who were here two weeks ago heard from Judge Chief Judge McConnell talk about the 36th District Court. He used to be one of those judges. And he has an extensive background in private practice even before he became a judge um, for the 36th District Court. So he's got a lot of knowledge, practical and legal, and at this time I want to bring forward Judge Mark Random, Judge of the United States Bankruptcy Court. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody can, can hear me. I want to uh, thank Mr. Kariga, the NAACP, and Wayne County Community College for allowing this to go forward today and giving me the opportunity to talk to all of you about bankruptcy court. As uh, Mr. Krieger indicated, I've been a judge now for about 21 years. In the last eight years, I've spent as a bankruptcy court judge. And the one thing that I've noticed in my years as a bankruptcy court judge is how underutilized bankruptcy is by many of the people in our community. So I'm really, really glad to be here this morning. I want to start out by throwing out some names of some people and some entities. Abraham Lincoln, Walt Disney, Milton Hershey, H.J. Hines, 50 Cent, Burt Reynolds, Tony Braxton, twice, Larry King, Mike Tyson, General Motors, Chrysler Corporation, Kmart Corporation, Delta Airlines, Donald Trump Casinos, twice, Toys R Us, the city of Stockton, and the city of Detroit. The one thing they all have in common is they have all filed bankruptcy. And so if you ever find yourself having to file bankruptcy, you are in good company. And the first thing I wanted to say about all these people and entities is they weren't defined by their bankruptcy filing. There is an unfortunate stigma that is associated with people who file bankruptcy. That should not be the case. I have served as a bankruptcy judge since 2014. I am here to serve you. And if you need the fresh start that bankruptcy offers, you should feel free to take advantage of that and you should not feel any stigma by doing that because you should know that the very city you live in, some of the presidents that are most admired, they've all taken advantage of bankruptcy. Why shouldn't you if you have the opportunity? Bankruptcy's been around, or at least the concept of bankruptcy, has been around for thousands of years, 3,000 years. It dates back to biblical times, and if you if you're familiar with the Bible in Deuteronomy 15, it talks about a form of bankruptcy. In Deuteronomy 15, verse 1 through 3, it says, at the end of every seven years, thou shalt make a release. Every creditor that lendeth ought unto his neighbor shall release it. He shall not exact it of his neighbor or his brother, because it's called the Lord's release. So in biblical days, every seven years, debts were forgiven. Creditors were required to forgive their debts. Well, how is that done today? Well, I serve on the bankruptcy court, which is actually just a couple of blocks from here. 211 West Fort Street is where the bankruptcy court is located in Detroit. And how that's done today is through what we call a discharge of debts. And what does a discharge of debts mean? Well, it means that at the end of a successful bankruptcy, the debtor is no longer obligated to pay certain of his or her unsecured debts. And the creditor can no longer try to collect those debts that have been discharged. So if you need bankruptcy relief, how do you go about doing that? Well, I want to talk mainly today about individual bankruptcies personal bankruptcies. 
So if someone out here needs to file personal bankruptcy, how do they do that? Well, it starts out, they will go to the bankruptcy court two blocks from here, and they will file a petition for bankruptcy relief. And that's what starts a bankruptcy case. Then they will have a list of schedules that they have to fill out, and these schedules list all of their debts and all of their assets. Okay. And in bankruptcy, an individual debtor has two choices that they have to select from. They can either go with a liquidation, which is a Chapter 7, or a reorganization, which is a Chapter 13. And I'm going to explain to you what each one of these is so that if you ever have to go to bankruptcy, you at least have a working familiarity with what takes place there. In a Chapter 7, the debtor basically gives up certain of their assets. Okay? Those assets are sold through the bankruptcy court, and whatever money's garnered from those assets are used to pay the creditors who file claims, and any claims that are not paid are discharged. The good news in filing a Chapter 7 is this, though. 95% of people that file Chapter 7 don't have to give up any assets. And we're going to get into that by an example. So they don't have to give up anything, but they get rid of a whole bunch of unsecured debt. Well, what is unsecured debt? Unsecured debt is debt that's not tied to any collateral. So, for example, a house. That's not unsecured debt because if you don't pay your house note, guess what? They're coming to get that house. A car is not unsecured debt because guess what? If you don't pay that car note, the repo man will be showing up at your door. But you can get rid of unsecured debt in bankruptcy. Well, what is that? Credit card debt is unsecured get debt. Medical bills are unsecured debt. All kinds of money judgments are unsecured debt. And so these are the kinds of things that if, you su if you're successful in filing a Chapter 7 liquidation, you can get rid of your responsibility for those. You can only get a Chapter 7 discharge once every eight years. And what's been happening is over the last I'd say 20 years, Congress has been trying to make it harder and harder for individuals to get Chapter 7 bankruptcy relief because it is such a good deal for individual debtors. I have seen, for example, people shed tens of thousands of credit card debt in bankruptcy, hundreds of thousands of medical bills in bankruptcy. Well, that's the point of bankruptcy. It's to give the debtor a fresh start so that that debtor can start over again without the burden of debt that becomes unmanageable. So in a Chapter 7, again, you're required to give up certain assets. They're sold um, and used to pay creditors. And then you get the discharge, and you get to keep your future income. Well, what happens, you say, if I got a house? That's an asset. And let's say I've got a lot of equity in that house, and I want to keep that house. Well, then Chapter 7 probably isn't the best option for you because if you have a house that's worth a lot of money or has a lot of equity in it, that's an asset that if you file Chapter 7, you're going to lose in bankruptcy. That house is going to be sold, and the proceeds of the sale of that house are going to be used to pay creditors. So in that case, you have, if you still have other bills that you want, unsecured debt that you want to get rid of, but you have some assets, you would file not a Chapter 7 liquidation, but a Chapter 13 or Chapter 11 reorganization. And what a reorganization is, is unlike a Chapter 7 where you have to sell assets, you get to keep your assets in a Chapter 13, but the way you pay back some of your debts is through a repayment plan that can last for three to five years. And you don't get a discharge until after you've made all your payments over three to five years. So for most lower income people, their best bet and often the most effective type of bankruptcy filing is a Chapter 7. 
Um, so let's look at an example. If we could go to the like the third slide, I think it is, where it says talks about maze. Oh, I have a clicker right here. Uh, let's see. Oh, great. So here's an example, and I got this example from what would be a typical low-income bankruptcy filing. Okay, and so this person just made up a name, May. She's 35. Um, she has two children, ages 15 and 9. She's single. She, last year she made $20,500. She was making more than that, but her hours were reduced at work. A lot of people go through that. And in 2021, um, the poverty level for a family of three, which May has, is $21,960. So May falls below the poverty level. Well, let's look at some of her liabilities. And again, when May files bankruptcy, she's going to have to list all of her liabilities on forms that are filed with a petition. Okay? May is, uh, she has to pay $675 a month. She's looking at eviction because she's fallen behind in her rent. She's got credit cards. She owes $2,500, so she's $500 over the limit. And this is what many debtors find themselves in. Once you get over the limit of those credit cards, then they add over the limit fees, late fees, and it becomes a vicious cycle that debtors can't get out of and they have to resort to bankruptcy. But it's something that's very helpful. Payday loans, another terrible, uh, really a scourge to the community, if you ask me, because of the excessive interest rates they charge. Some payday lenders will charge up to 1,000% interest over the course of a year. So look at May, and this comes from a case that we, I had. She initially only borrowed 500, she now owes over $2,000. She's got utilities of 3,500, she's facing a shutoff. She's got furniture, um, she purchased on credit card at a, at a furniture store and on the store's credit, and she has medical bills of $18,000, primarily for her son's emergency room visit and hospitalization. Okay, so she owes, $27,800. Let's look at May's assets. Again, May's also going to have to list her assets when she files bankruptcy. And she doesn't have that many assets, like many debtors. Her assets are, she's got some furniture, she's got some household furnishings, she's got TV, cell phone, computer, um, she's got $425 in cash, she's got clothes, She's got a 2007 Chevy Malibu that needs repairs. She has a 401k from one of the jobs she has. It's got $1,200 in it. And she has her dad's watch worth about $500 for a total of $5,000 in assets. So what are her options? The best option for May is um, Chapter 7, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But if she files a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy, both are going to stop the collections activity. They're going to stop these annoying calls that creditors tend to make because once you file bankruptcy, if a creditor continues to try and collect from you, they will get sanctioned by the court and they will have to pay you as the debtor. Um, bankruptcy can stop garnishments and at least temporarily stop her from getting evicted from her apartment and stop her lights and gas from being turned off. Both offer the possibility of a fresh start for May's $28,700 of unsecured debt. But Chapter 13 offers May far less hope of a discharge. And why is that? Because a repayment plan isn't in her best interest. So a Chapter 13 is not in May's best interest. Because after she pays all her bills, and household expenses, she's just got $125 left over every month to manage that $27,800 debt load. It's not working for her and May needs bankruptcy relief. But I will tell you, there are thousands of people like May in our community that don't file bankruptcy, even though you're going to see what a benefit this can be for May. Okay. So what if May files Chapter 7 bankruptcy? 
Well, her non-exempt assets, meaning assets that she can't protect in the bankruptcy, are going to be sold and used to pay down her debts. Um, but the good news for May is that bankruptcy allows you to keep certain assets. You don't have to sell them in bankruptcy. So, for example, you don't have to sell a, a, your interest in a car uh, if that car is paid for and is worth, like, around 3000 or so dollars. Your interest in a house, furniture, household goods, clothes, appliances, TV, computer, et cetera, jewelry, cash, and other items. Well, what does that mean? That means May can keep everything she's got. She's not living in a house so that's worth a lot of money. So there's no house to be sold. So she's not, and everything else, the little bit of money that she has, her clothes, her furniture, her car, she's going to be able to keep all that, but she's going to be able to get rid of all those, that $27,800 worth of debt. Okay? Um, and once she successfully completes bankruptcy, May's not going to have any personal liability for that debt. Those medical bills, those credit cards, they're not going to be able to try to collect. They're not even going to be able to request payment from May. And if they do, they will be sanctioned by the bankruptcy court. And May gets to keep, because she's not in a repayment plan, she's filed a Chapter 7, May will get to keep all her future income from her job. So she's going to get rid of $27,800 worth of debt, and she's going to be able to keep all her future income. And just like May, approximately 95% of Chapter 7 bankruptcies are no asset cases. And what that means is that the debtors will get to keep all the assets they have and get rid of most of their unsecured debts. Now, there are exceptions as to what debts can be, unsecured debts can be discharged. For example, one of the biggest unsecured debts that can't be discharged in bankruptcy, unfortunately, is student loans. Student loans used to be discharged in, used to be able to get discharged in bankruptcy, but the student loan lenders went to Congress, lobbied Congress, and Congress changed that. Perhaps now with the increase in student loans that's happened, um, Congress will revisit making student loans dischargeable in bankruptcy, but right now they are not. The other thing, good thing about Chapter 7 as opposed to Chapter 13 is Chapter 7 only takes three to six months. So three to six months after May files bank, Chapter 7 bankruptcy, her medical bills and credit card debt, they're gone. Um, and approximately 95% of Chapter 7 debtors actually get a discharge. What would be the reasons why they don't get a discharge? If you lie about your assets or your income, that would be a reason for, for not getting a discharge. If you don't fill out the forms correctly, if you don't attend the required meetings or get the required uh, financial counseling, that would be a reason for not getting a discharge. But as you can see, the vast majority of Chapter 7 debtors actually do get a discharge. How much does it cost to file Chapter 7? It costs $338. Okay? Most people need a lawyer to help them navigate the Chapter 7 filing. And the lawyer generally charges $900 to $1,800 to file a Chapter 7. Here's the problem for most debtors in our community. That money, that legal fee, has to be paid up front in a Chapter 7 because of the way the law is structured. Um, and so, some people like May that need bankruptcy, the reason why they can't get it is because they can't afford to, to, to pay for the lawyer. Now, a lot of times, because they can't afford to pay for the lawyer, Low-income debtors will go a different route. They will file a Chapter 13. And it's a risky choice, especially for low-income debtors like May that doesn't have a house, that wouldn't lose anything in the bankruptcy. Why is it risky? Because um, May now is going to have to put that $125 of disposable income that she has every month, she's going to have to pay that for three to five years. If she misses any payments, 
she doesn't get the discharge. Um, and as you can see, because you have to make payments for three to five years, less than half of Chapter 13 debtors get to a discharge because you're in a payment plan. And like they say, things happen over five years. You lose a job, someone dies, you get divorced. A lot of things can happen where you won't be able to make your payments. So why would May even think about filing Chapter 13? The only reason is because she can't afford to pay a lawyer, and in a Chapter 13, you can pay your lawyer over the three to five years. So May doesn't have to come up with the money up front. She can pay it over time. The problem is Chapter 13s are a lot more expensive. So why is May's access to bankruptcy relief she needs limited? Perhaps because she's not aware of the option to file bankruptcy. By the way, um, there are organizations, one I want you to be aware of, called Access to Bankruptcy, www.accesstobankruptcy.com. If you need to file a Chapter 7 and you can't afford it, Access to Bankruptcy provides free lawyers so that you don't have to file a Chapter 13 when you're eligible for a Chapter 7, www.accesstobankruptcycourt.com. So why wouldn't May file bankruptcy? She doesn't know about her option to file bankruptcy and get rid of all of her debt. Like I said, there's a stigma that's associated with bankruptcy. People feel like they're failures if they file bankruptcy. Um, I don't know where that comes from, and that's why I started with saying presidents of the United States have filed bankruptcy. Milton Hershey, the, the, the company, the, the chocolate, chocolatier, filed bankruptcy. Delta Airlines, how many people have flown that airline? has filed bankruptcy. General Motors, even the city of Detroit. So there should be no stigma associated. And then the most, Im the two most important, she could be too poor to file chapter bankruptcy because she doesn't believe that she has enough money to pay a lawyer. And race and poverty do income, do affect uh, bankruptcy chapter selection. All right, we'll skip that. Now, many people think, again, that people who file bankruptcy are doing so because they're just reckless and irresponsible with their money. And that's not true. I've been a bankruptcy judge, again, for eight years, and most people don't file money, don't file bankruptcy because they've been reckless with their finances. And this study bears that out. They did a study between 2013 and 2016 of all bankruptcy filers. And it shows that the number one reason why people file bankruptcy is because of income loss. They lost a job, their wages were cut, um, they got injured on the job so they're not making as much money. That's the number one reason. Number two reason, medical expenses. Third reason, they're facing a foreclosure. Another big reason why people file bankruptcy is because they got divorced and the financial strain that causes. Only a small fraction file bankruptcy because they've been spending or living beyond their means. Student loans also is a big reason, and people trying to help friends and relatives pulling themselves down. Now, if you add these up, it adds up to more than 100%, and the reason that is is because people could select more than one answer. Okay. Um, Now, I want to uh, point out this next slide. The income level at which you can file Chapter 7 bankruptcy without any problem. So if you're a single person and you make at or around $53,000, you're eligible to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy without much question. Family of two, if you make less than $67,000 eligible to file bankruptcy, and that's a household income. So if there's two people in the income, both their incomes add up to less than 67,000, you can file Chapter 7 bankruptcy with no problem. Three people in the family, 
80,000 or less, you can file bankruptcy, no problem. A family of four that makes less than 100,000 can file Chapter 7 bankruptcy with pretty much no questions asked. So Chapter 7 is available to a lot more debtors than they really believe in the community. There's another myth about bankruptcy filers that I want to dispel. And that is that African American filers are over filing relative to their numbers in the community. That's just not what we see. Given the income gap between African Americans and Caucasians, you would think that more black people as a percentage file bankruptcy than white people, but that is not the case. And if you look at the numbers from 2006 and 2010, and more recent numbers bear this out, if you look at all the bankruptcies filed in 2006, the percentage of black filers was 15% of all bankruptcy filings in 2006. In 2010, it was 11.3% of all bankruptcy filers. So the percentage of African Americans taking advantage of bankruptcy is going down. And if you look, the, the population of, percentage of African Americans in the population is in 2010, based on the census, was 12.6%. So actually for 2010, African Americans are filing in lower numbers than they should be. Um, an interesting study that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the other thing is there's implicit bias in bankruptcy that needs to be, to be brought to light. That is that a lot of African Americans and poor debtors in general, lawyers, bankruptcy lawyers will steer them into filing chapter 13s when it's in their benefit to file chapter 7. Why is that? Because Lawyers get paid more in Chapter 13. I hate to say it, that's part of the reason, okay? The other reason is because, it's particularly when it comes to African-American debtors, there's a perception that the reason why they file is because of, you know, poor spending habits as opposed to financial need. And so there was this study that was done. And I think it was done in 2016 or 2017, but, they had these debtors, couples, one named Reggie and Letitia, and they deliberately tried to give them African-American sounding names, and the other couple was Todd and Allison. Other than the names, their financial picture was exactly the same. Only thing that was different was the names. And they sent these, these people to different bankruptcy lawyers across the country. Now, um, it was a close call between whether these couples should file Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. But generally, it was in the best interest of these couples to file Chapter 7. Well, look what happened. Both couples were portrayed as sympathetic and church-going. But the attorneys recommended that Reggie and Letitia file Chapter 13 47% of the time, but Todd and Allison only 32% of the time. And that is consistent with data that shows blacks file Chapter 13 at a rate of 55%, while it's only 29% for whites. And most bankruptcy attorneys incorrectly believe that whites are twice as more likely to file Chapter 13 than blacks. What am I saying? I'm not trying to make an issue of race here. What I'm just trying to say is that many poor and debtors and debtors of color don't file bankruptcy. And when they do file bankruptcy, they tend to file in a chapter that is not to their benefit. Chapter seven is oftentimes gonna be the best chapter in which to file, unless, again, you own a home that has a lot of equity in it. What, what can we do to change this? Um, we can diversify the bench and bar. There are very few African-American bankruptcy lawyers and judges. 
I'm the only African-American bankruptcy judge in Michigan. Um, there are probably only 10 across the United States. Um, we can make it so that Chapter 7 filing fees can be paid over time. That would make it much better and easier for low-income debtors to file Chapter 7. Um, and another thing we can do is create more programs, again, like access to bankruptcy. And I really want to stress access to bankruptcy because, again, they provide free lawyers for people of all races. It's just based on income. If you're low income and you need to file a Chapter 7, you can go to access to bankruptcy. They will get you a lawyer to file your bankruptcy so that you can get the fresh start that bankruptcy provides. As a bankruptcy judge, I am here to serve you. Uh, I have been a judge, as Mr. Krieger said, in different courts. I love being a bankruptcy judge because I get to help people get a fresh start. The alternative is that people are mired in debt that just consumes them, um, leads to mental health issues, it leads to all kinds of societal and sy systemic problems. So I enjoy my role as a bankruptcy judge. If you ever need to file, um, you can reach out to me. I may not be able to talk to you directly about your case, uh, but I can give you some general advice or direct you in to the right person. And uh, that is the conclusion of my presentation. I'd like to leave it open for any questions. Yes. <clears throat> Thanks for your reminder. Um, hello, Judge. My name is Tawana, and I'm a um, veteran. And when I was married in the 80s, my husband was also, well, we were still in the military at the time. And we were divorced in California. And um, when I got divorced from him, put, put the mic to my, oh, oh yes, Mr. Gregor. Anyway, when we when we got our divorce, you know, California has a community property law, and he was a little more savvy than I was at the time. You know, I was really young. And um, I found out later that he never, like we had credit cards in our name together, and the, the cards kind of reverted to my credit history. Now, this being in the 80s, Judge, would that still be on my... Um, when I recently checked my credit report, <coughs> excuse me, sir, I slept under dry heat last night. It's hard to talk. When I recently checked my credit report, it said that I only had two outstanding debts. However, I now I'm, I'm, I'm used to paying cash for things or I'll wait and save for items. And I guess like, what I'm trying to say is that I, I still think that all those credit cards and things that we had both of our names, so there was vehicles, and, um, and, and kind of, you know, the divorce kind of ruined my credit. Well, typically what happens is negative credit um, reports typically only can stay on your credit report for seven years. Oh, okay. After seven years, they typically drop off. All right, yes, sir. Now, a debt can be collected for, like, you can be sued for a judgment, it can be only collected for 10 years, and it can be okay. renewed typically for up to another 10 years. Oh, so certainly it can only years. stay on your record for seven years, and it can really only be collected for a maximum of 20 years. After that, it sort of drops off your... Right. And most of these stores, like May Company, now, they're, they're no longer in business. Not something at this juncture you should have to worry about. How long ago oh, was it? Um, I got divorced in 1986 oh, yeah, in, no, in no, California. No, no. Not when I recently... Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Judge. No, when no, I recently checked my credit report, and the only thing on there was um, an Edison bill from back in 2010, you know, because I recently relocated back to Michigan. But <clears throat> and then I paid that off was $139, and then I had another bill for 768 that shouldn't have been on there for medical because the Department of Veteran Affairs covers all my medical because I'm a um, disabled war veteran. Right. You can call um, any creditor and ask them to remove um, a negative credit item from your credit particularly if it's been over seven years, you have the right to do that. 
no, the medical bill has been on there for, I think, four years. And I'm like, how do I have a medical bill? It was like an emergency room bill when I had broke my ankle during the winter. We had a really bad winter. And they took me to receiving and said it's the VA. Right. You can challenge that. Oh, I would okay. start I by contacting. Oh, okay. Yeah, I would start by contacting the person, like the billing company, the hospital that you went to. Okay, yes, sir. Ask them to remove it. It's best if they do, and if they don't, you can go to the um, Equifax, Experian, Transworld, those are the three credit companies, and go to them directly and ask them to remove it. All right, yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Any, Judge, any we do have a, another question here. You said that when you're filing um, a Chapter uh, 13, you're paying some of your creditors back. Yes. Uh, I had to file that, and it kind of put me into a lot of bills. I accumulated a whole lot of bills, and that was what the lawyer suggested that I do. Yeah, that's what I was sort of trying Long to point. Long time ago. He yeah, that's what I was trying to tr trying to point out is that sometimes it's not best to file a Chapter 13. A Chapter 13 is a very specific type of bankruptcy for those people that have assets they want to protect. So, for example, if I had a house that I inherited that was worth 200000 and I inherited it was paid off, I wouldn't want to file bankruptcy because they're going to sell that $200,000 house, and they're going to use the money for that to pay off my creditors. But if you're not in that situation, a Chapter 7 is usually a better option than a Chapter 13. So it sounds like what you got into is a repayment plan. Yes. Um, and a lot of times... If the repayment plan doesn't work out, there is a danger in filing a Chapter 13 because if your repayment plan doesn't work out, you don't get the discharge, which means you don't get basically, I don't want to call it forgiveness, but it is really sort of a forgiveness of debt that comes at the end of the bankruptcy. And you still have to pay your lawyer, and so sometimes people that file a Chapter 13 that doesn't work out are in worse shape than if they never filed bankruptcy in the first place. Right. I was... It was it was sort of like that for me. I got out of it. I paid everybody, but I was so drained after that. I, I should have done the a seven. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the only danger. Now I do want to make this clear because I don't want you calling me saying, "Oh, Judge Rana told me to file a seven. Again, I want to tell you if you have valuable assets, that doesn't just mean a house. Some people have car collections, stamp collections, jewelry, artwork that is worth a lot of money, in bankruptcy, you could be forced to sell a lot of that stuff. Now, you can't be forced to sell furniture, clothes, tools of the trade, um, stuff like that, but you can be forced to sell, you can protect some jewelry, but you, you can be forced to sell artwork, certain investments. I would say this other thing, too. The last point I want to make about bankruptcy is, for those young people listening to me, one of the things that the bankruptcy law suggests is the best place to put your money is in a 401k or an IRA. Those vehicles are bankruptcy proof. What does that mean? I can have a million dollars in a 401k and file Chapter 7 bankruptcy if I meet those income levels. And they won't be able to touch that money in the 401k. Why is it set up like that? Because that's the way Congress set it up. So rich people can file bankruptcy. You have to know, and we have to be educated on where the best places are to put our money. A 401k and an IRA, untouchable in bankruptcy. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. So, so um, I, I noticed you said uh, there's like a stigma around bankruptcy, and I can attest to that because normally, when you go and apply, if you like applying for a mortgage or if you want to get a new car or credit card, one of the one of the questions they ask you is, "Have you ever filed bankruptcy?" So I know a lot of people uh, have a stigma around it because they feel as if, especially black people, but they feel as if if they file bankruptcy, they'll get rid of the debt, but then they think they won't be able to get anything new. Is there any way that you can combat that? Uh, so like, if I filed bankruptcy, let's say two years ago, and I want to buy a house. Is there any way to combat that 
when they ask that question and say, well, we're going to deny you because you filed bankruptcy? That's an excellent question. I can give you a, a, an example of a, of a good friend of mine who was just drowning in credit card debt, didn't want to file bankruptcy because he figured, man, down the line, it's going to stop me from getting to where I need to be. He filed Chapter 7, got a discharge of his debts. The thing that lenders don't want to tell you is about three or four years after filing bankruptcy, Chapter 7, your credit rating is actually starts to skyrocket. And the reason it starts to skyrocket is because you can only file bankruptcy once every eight years. So a lender can lend money knowing this person's not going to be able, they borrow from me, they're not going to be able to file another bankruptcy and get another discharge for another number of years. So three to four years after bankruptcy, my friend was able to get a, a house, and guess what? I got good credit. His interest rate was lower than mine. Um, so that's the secret, and that's why, yes, they do put it on there to kind of discourage people, but again, about three to four years after filing bankruptcy, your credit will be better than it was before you filed. Because remember, if, you, if you're so far behind in credit card bills and stuff that you need to file bankruptcy, your credit's kind of messed up anyway, it really starts to go up. So the thing I would say to you is that it's just, it's just really knowledge. Banks will try and discourage you from filing, but the law says they have to approve you if you've got the right credit, and your credit does start to go up two to four years after filing bankruptcy. It's just those first two years that it's difficult to obtain credit. We have a question from the chat. Um, it's consistent with what you were just referencing. Uh, credit card companies sometimes when they are discharged in bankruptcy will then give you another card and they say you have to reinstate the debt that you were discharged from. Well, is that legal or what to respond to that? All right, so um, when you file bankruptcy and you get a discharge, the important thing to know is it doesn't make the debt go away. It just releases your personal liability to pay the debt. So for example, and I'll get to your, your question, Mr. Parita, but for example, so if you co-sign for someone, and that person you co-sign for files bankruptcy, that's going to get them out of the debt. And it's going to leave you holding the bag. Because the debt when in bankruptcy doesn't get rid of the debt. It just gets rid of the person who filed bankruptcies liability to pay the debt. So getting back to the question, after you file bankruptcy, a credit card company is not allowed to ask you to repay that discharge debt. And if they do, they are in violation of the bankruptcy code. Sometimes what they do to try and do it a different way is they say, well, we're not asking you to pay the debt. What we're saying to you is if you, we'll give you another credit card if you voluntarily uh, pay your past debt, because they can't demand it of you. I would say in that instance, stay away from that credit card company, because like I said, a couple years after you file, you're going to get flooded with credit card companies offering you credit without having to pay any debt that was discharged in bankruptcy. Because remember, once a debt has been discharged, that creditor can never demand payment. So they try these little slick ways of trying to, I'm not demanding payment, I'm just saying if you want to volunteer and pay, we'll give you a new credit card. Why would you do that when within two years you're going to get credit card offers that come with no obligation to repay any discharge debt? Yes, sir. Twice. Well, what, what, what they did is, so when it, it's a little different when a corporation files bankruptcy. Um, he, he filed like reorganizations. So what you do there is, again, it's just like a corporate repayment plan. So what he was able to do is reduce the debt and pay back a fraction of the, pay back a fraction of the amount. And that's what he got criticized for, remember, when he was running. There were all these workers saying, I was a contractor at a Trump casino. Trump owed me 100000 200000 300000 Rather than pay me the money, 
he filed bankruptcy and I only got paid 10 cents on the dollar. And he's putting himself out there as this businessman. Well, okay, I don't have a problem. I'm a bankruptcy judge. So you can think what you want of what that, that, but um, there are a lot of businesses that file bankruptcy. But you're right, in that case, um, a lot of people that were owed money by the Trump casinos got stiffed because of his because of the business bankruptcy fund. I was purchasing a house at the time. Okay. And I think maybe that's why we did the 13. Why you did the chapter 13? And the, and the car and it was just yeah. Did you own a cha did you own a house at the time? Yeah. That may have been the reason. Cuz one of the good things. Now, I kind of the last point I'll make is I kind of boohoo chapter 13 bankruptcy. There is a place for it. The one place for it is if let's say you own a home and you're behind in your house payments and you're facing eviction because you're behind in your mortgage payments. Let's say the house is worth a lot of money, but they're trying to evict you or foreclose on you because you haven't made your mortgage payments. The one good thing about Chapter 13 is if you file before your house is sold at the auction, you can catch up those back house payments over three to five years. So that is a case where it would be good to file a Chapter 13. I'm just saying in most cases, especially if you don't own a home, Chapter 7 is best. Yeah. Maybe you, maybe you could have filed a Chapter 7. I would have to look a little more detailed, but I, I, I will leave it, absolutely. I, I can give it to you. When we have that information. We can give it to you. There's one other question out of the chat. Um, someone said that... Um, Filing for a Chapter Seven, you could be disqualified if you if if your debt was related to some kind of drug or alcohol abuse, or something of that nature. If your debt was related to drug or alcohol abuse, that was a question. Um, I don't know what kind of debt that would be, but I know this: that people get rid of um, gambling debts. People are able to get rid of a lot of debts in bankruptcy. Now, some of the other debts that you can't get rid of are debts for intentional acts. If I was to come leave the stage and just punch one of you, and you sued me for that, I'm not being able, I can't get rid of that in bankruptcy because that was an intentional act. I also can't get rid of debts that were obtained by fraud. So if I got money from someone lying on my application saying I made X amount of dollars when I didn't, that's another type of debt that can't be discharged in bankruptcy. But I'm not, I'm not sure that that's accurate. The question. Great. Other questions? Thank you very much, right, thank Judge you. Randon. Let's have a round of applause for Judge Randon here. Okay, we're running a little ahead of schedule this morning. Uh, we're going to take a very short break. Lunch should be here shortly. And if it is, we'll have our lunch break now and then continue with our program. So 15-minute break.
Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. Don't mean to interrupt your conversations. I just want to make a couple of brief announcements, and then I'm going to ask Richard Mack, who is the chair of our Legal Redress Committee, to come up and talk to you about a couple of issues coming up. First of all, you know this is a program performed, uh, put on jointly by the NAACP, and we're very pleased and honored to be uh, hosted by the Wayne County Community College District. 
uh, we have, this is a four week law school program. This is the third of four. Next week, we will be virtual and we will be broadcasting from the offices of the NAACP at 8220 2nd Avenue. So we ask that you all join us then because we've got a lot of good topics that we're also going to review next week. In the meantime, there are additional matters that are going to be happening, not only in the meantime, but going forward. We know we've got an election coming up on November the 8th, probably one of the most important elections of your lifetime. I know you hear that every election day. But in advance of that, in preparation for that, the NAACP is very active, nonpartisan, but we do hold forums in which candidates are able to make themselves available to you to talk about their candidacy and why you should vote for them. Not only them, but the proposals that we have. On October 25th, it's a Tuesday, from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Horatio Williams Foundation, which is on 1010-1010 Antietam, Antietam, Detroit 4207, there will be a school board candidates fair. I think you've got four positions available on the school board and you've got 18 candidates. So you need to know who these people are so that you can know whether you want to vote for them or not. That'll be happening that day in person put on by the Detroit branch NAACP. On Saturday, November the 5th, the Saturday before the election, uh, at the Detroit branch NAACP, 8220 2nd Avenue, that's at the corner of Seward, there'll be a party at the polls. All kinds of activities going on, and there will be a march to the de offices of the Detroit Department of Elections from 2nd and Seward to the Department of Elections as part of the party at the poll. These are all activities that are designed to get people to engage in the electoral process. On next Saturday at 4 p.m., I'm sorry, at 6 p.m. at the UAW Training Center, there will be an election protection training program teaching people how to be election uh, challengers and election monitors. This is not the program where uh, the clerks are trained to be clerks or assistant clerks. This is a program where individual citizens such as yourself are trained and can be credentialed to go into the polling place in the polling area and watch the election to make sure nothing wrong happens. That's next Saturday, 6 p.m., UAW Vote Center. It's on Livernoy Avenue, just south of Finkel. And I don't have the exact address, but uh, if you call the Detroit branch, 8712087 you can get all that information the election protection training will be occurring on the 22nd of October and on the 29th of October both times at that UAW vote center so now i'd like to ask richard mack our chair of our legal redress committee to come on and give you a little information about some of the ballot proposals Greetings, greetings. Um, thank you all again for coming here, person and online. Uh, it's also always very exciting to uh, be able to present such wealth of information to you at these George Crockett Law Centers. Did want to briefly touch on the ballot proposals. We're going to hear a lot about Proposal 3 in a little bit, um, but there are a couple of other proposals on the ballot, Proposals 1 and 2. Um, 
and I want to just kind of give you an overview of what they are. Proposal one basically is a change in the term limits for state house and state senate. Uh, if you've been here early, uh, we've talked about how you have basically in our government, you have a state house and you have a state senate. Those are two uh, uh, bodies of the legislative body, two arms of the legislative body. And each of them currently uh, have term limits, which is a term limit is if I'm a politician, I can only run for a certain number of years. A, and that's limited as to how many terms or how many years total I can be in office. And then once I hit that term, it's over. I, I'm, I no longer can hold that particular office. Currently, the term limits in the state of Michigan are that you can be a state senator, which is, you know, has a, a, bit, a bit of a larger geographic area than a state House of Representatives member, a member of the House of Representatives. But you can be a state senator for two terms, which is four years each, so that's a total of eight. And you can be a state House of Representatives member for three terms, which is two years apiece. So that's a total of six. So eight plus six is 14 years currently you can be in either of those two bodies. What this law does is it changes it from a total of two over here and three over there, it's kind of confusing, to just a total of 12 years. So whether you want to run for two terms, you can be three terms as a state senator, you get zero terms as state house. You can do six terms as a state house member, you can do zero terms as state senate. So a total of 12 years. So it simplifies it um, and also what the law does is it makes uh, the politicians who are running for office to disclose their income and their finances and, and where they make their money and any professional relationships that they may have. Uh, it's interesting that Michigan is one of two states out of the other 50 that does not require people running for elective office to disclose their personal income. You have to disclose, obviously, donations made to you, but not your own personal income, what you've done and how you've made it and relationships you may have. So this law changes that as well. Um, proposal two, uh, a, a, bit of, a bit of history on proposal two. Uh, and and I, I, let me just say this. Um, the NAACP is a nonpartisan organization. Uh, and, and we don't, you know, we cannot endorse any particular candidate for office. Um, one thing I can do, though, is to at least describe the history of why Proposal 2 is important. Um, proposal 2 is basically a, an effort to protect the right to vote uh, within the state of Michigan. And it has to be redone. And the reason it has to be redone is because in 2018, you all may remember on the ballot, we had Proposal 3, which put into office things like no, absent, no reason absentee voting. If you, you may remember from for 2018, in order to vote absentee, you have to either be 60 years or older, or you have to say you're out of town or whatever. You had to have some one of six reasons. Well, Proposal 3 in 2018, which passed by nearly, I think it was over two-thirds vote, got rid of that. So anyone who wants to vote absentee, meaning you don't have to be on it, at the polls on election Tuesday, but you can vote by mail, that's absentee voting by mail, you know, you, you can do that now for no reason at all, any reason. You know, you just have to apply for the ballot, have it be mailed to you, and then you can vote. And so there are a number of other things. Being able to register, you may remember before 2018, you had to register at least 30 days before the election. And if you weren't registered before the election 30 days, then you, you know, you just couldn't vote. So, we, you know, at our church, we would get that, be in a big hustle to try to make sure folk got registered before the 30-day deadline. Now you can literally register on the day of the election under Proposal 3. So what happened in, in 2018 was we had uh, Governor Rick Snyder and a Republican-controlled House and Senate, and they decided to make some changes to the law that had just been passed by more than two-thirds majority vote to kind of weaken the impact of Proposal 3. And then you, in 2021, in June, you had 39 bills that came out of the Michigan State House and Senate that were also designed to weaken the right to vote. Um, it's not rocket science, really. Again, not trying to be overly partisan, but 
uh, statistics will show, any election statistics you look at will show that the more people that vote, the, likely, the more likely it is for the Democratic candidates to win or the Democratic Party to win. So Republicans literally since for decades now, since er earlier uh, last century, uh, have been making efforts to reduce the ability of individuals to vote. You know, we saw the bubbles on the bar of soap test that, that used to have black people make back in the 50s and the 40s. Uh, and so that sort of continued on until these bills today, where again in 2021 you saw uh, other efforts to try to make it harder to vote for uh, individuals. The, the things like requiring you to present an ID. If you don't have an ID, your, uh, your uh, ballot is what's called provisional, meaning you may not, it may not count. Um, things like in order to apply for absentee, you have to attach a copy of your driver's license. Just put that in the mail. Well, I don't know how many of you all are comfortable with putting your copy of your driver's license in the mail assuming that you have a printer, which my printer not even working at my house, right? So th all of these different, what's that? Oh, put the mic closer, okay. All of these different uh, things that are being done um, in these Republican bills, these were not made law, these were proposals that Republicans in the House and Senate put forward in the state house and state senate put forward to try to weaken the right to vote. And again, the idea is to get less people to the polls, particularly less black and brown people to the polls. That's just kind of what happened. That's calling it as it is. So proposal two is a, is a constitutional amendment. It's a proposal to amend the constitution to make sure that a lot of those shenanigans don't happen and to make sure that there are even more protections in the right to vote. And putting it in the constitution is really important because it means that if the legislature in the state is controlled by the Republican Party, who is always in an effort to try to lessen the right to vote, uh, that they won't be able to do that, that they have to go back to the people to make change to the law. So just a couple of the things that will be within proposal two. Uh, they will have a minimum of a nine day window before election day itself for uh, voters to vote. So and this is the minimum, so di jurisdictions can have an even longer period of time beyond the nine days, but at a minimum, every jurisdiction will have to be able, will have to allow voters to vote between the second Saturday before the election all the way through the first Sunday before the election. So those nine days, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, all the way up to the following Sunday. Monday, there's no, no voting, and then Tuesday, it was an election day. That's critical, it thinks it, it captures those two Sundays um, you know, we like to go to church and often many churches, as they should, engage their, their parishioners in voting activities. And so that will be, that, that will be part of that. Um, it will require state-funded postage for absentee ballots. So, you know, if, if you don't have a stamp and you want to apply absentee, you don't need a stamp. It's going to be free. You put it back in the mail. Um, it will require a continue, it will continue to allow registered voters to vote without a state ID and to simply sign an affidavit um, to verify that they are who they are. So if, in other words, you go to the polls, you do have to have your ID, that's the law. If you don't have your ID, you can still vote a regular ballot. You just have to sign an affidavit indicating, yes, I'm Richard Mack and I just don't have my ID, whatever, and then they give you a regular ballot. There were a lot of efforts within these 39 bills to try to change that. This constitutional amendment will pr make sure that that remains the case. It will allow public sources and charities to fund elections subject to disclosure rules. So what we saw, particularly in the 2020 election, and again, a lot of these proposals are in response not just to efforts by the Republican Party to weaken the right to vote, but also what we saw in 2020 from the our president of uh, these United States literally made efforts to try to throw out votes, not just in Georgia, where he's looking for the 13th uh, to 11,000, but here in Michigan to try to throw out votes, to threaten canvases whose job it is to count votes. And so a lot of these things in proposal three, I'm uh, sorry, proposal two are in response to that. And this is one that public sources and charities can help fund election processes, right? So we did see that when that, when, when the efforts of President Trump happened, we saw on the other side people starting to put money toward making sure that we had enough poll workers and that we had training for poll workers. Not on behalf of any particular party, not on behalf of any particular agenda, 
just making sure that the election process works smoothly so that we don't have long lines at the polls and we don't have people confused about where to vote, polls closing, things like that. So this proposal allows a in the Constitution of Michigan to have public funding of, of election processes. Um, allows voters to register to vote absentee for all future elections. Now this is, I think, pretty important. Um, Trump went after our Secretary of State, Johnson Vincent, for having the gall to mail out absentee ballots, applications, not ballots, applications. Literally what she did is she sent to Michiganders, if you want to vote absentee, here's an application, fill it out, send it back. If you, if you registered and if you're square and if everything checks out, we'll send you an actual ballot. Well, that was too much because again, what it did is it opened up a greater opportunity for everyone to participate in the process. And so this proposal not only allows that, but it goes further and it says that you can go to your secretary of state or your clerk's office and say, I want to vote absentee for the rest of my life. And, and that, that will be possible. And if you think about it, what's wrong with that, right? If you know that voting by mail is safe, is there's no instances of significant fraud found, and why not allow that to happen? So this proposal allows that to happen. Uh, requires military and overseas ballots to be counted if postmarked by election day. So it gives those who are serving overseas, they have to be mailed out their ballot, I believe it's 45 days beforehand. And if they do get that, Ballot. And if they mail it back, as long as the, the envelope is postmarked by election day, and it's, it should be received hopefully six days thereafter, then that vote can be counted. And that's important for folk, obviously, who are serving our country. We don't want to deny them the right to vote simply because they're, they're protecting us overseas. Um, require mail drop, mail, I'm sorry, require ballot drop boxes for every 15,000 voters in a municipality. Now, this is pretty important. It allows for, for the mailbox drop, the mail, the ballot drop box. Why is it not coming out right? The ballot drop box is a place where you can put your absentee ballot if you don't want to mail it back. If you don't want to go to the Secretary of State or the clerk's office and provide it, you can simply walk down the street, hopefully, or at your nearest Kroger's or grocery stores or wherever, and put it in the drop box. And this is saying, this proposal will require that every municipality for every 15,000 voters will be required to have a drop box. And, and that's important because it gives people the chance, again, all of this is making it easier for you to engage in the process. Uh, a couple more here, it establish a post-election audit that is only conducted by state and local officials. So we don't want members of any particular party, and again, the Republican Party in the 2020 election, you know, made efforts to try to do their own audits and all of this other stuff, have other people conduct audits. Uh, the people who ought to be auditing our elections, which they should be audited uh, to make sure that everything checks out, are people who are state or local officials, not people from the outside. And then finally, require canvassing boards to only, only canvassing boards to certify election results that are only based on official vote counts. So literally, we had instances in this state where the President of the United States called the state canvassers whose job, whose main job is to certify the election results, make sure that the vote took place, look at the numbers, how it came out, how they were counted, and determine, yes, we are certifying that this is the election outcome. We had the President call those canvassers to tell them to refuse to certify a valid election. Now, that, that's just detestable. I don't think that's ever happened in our country, not that we know of. But what this constitutional amendment would say is that the canvassing boards, they have to certify. They can't buckle the pressure. They can't come up with other reasons why certain things didn't happen. They have to look at the results, look at what the official count is, and if, it's, if it is, is verifiable, then it, you have to certify. And so these are important, important provisions which uh, we believe uh, are necessary um, uh, for the Constitution, but that is Proposal 2. So those are both uh, Proposals 1 and Proposals 2. And do I introduce? Without further ado, I'm going to bring back up the General Counsel of the uh, uh, branch, Detroit branch NAACP, Chewy Correct. Thank you. Well, 
We have a dynamic speaker coming for you next, but we also have lunch here. So I'm going to ask you to take five minutes to grab your lunch, bring it back to your seat, and we'll continue the program in roughly five minutes. Thank you.
Good afternoon again, everybody. Thank you for coming back so promptly. This afternoon, you're next in for a treat. You have one of the most dynamic speakers, smartest lawyers, and best persons in our area that's going to come to you this afternoon and talk about your right to choose and the status of abortion rights in Michigan. Kalila Spencer, she is a, an attorney. Her biography is in your packet. It does not do her justice. It doesn't say enough good things about her. But without further ado, let me just turn it over to Ms. Spencer. Thank you, Chewy. I'm, I'm not sure about the bio in the packet, but I hope it's a good one. Hopefully my, my favorite PR person, Latoya Henry, wrote it. Um, I was asked to give a background on um, Roe v. Wade, Dobbs v. Jackson Health Organization, and really just a, a brief overview of the current status of abortion rights in Michigan. And then my understanding is that you will have a panel after me to talk in detail about Proposal 3, which is the Reproductive Freedom for All initiative that overwhelmingly receive signatures um, to put that ballot, I'm sorry, that initiative on the ballot. So that is a worthy hand clap, absolutely. Give me a second while I pull up my presentation so I don't have to keep looking to the side. Um, as most of you know, abortion, right is, abortion rights is top of mind um, this year given the overturning of Roe v. Wade by the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and for most of you, um, everyone sort of was kind of in shock and awe at the overturning of that decision. I don't think even though the decision was leaked, uh, most people understood that that was actually going to happen. I guess people thought that the Supreme Court was going to revise their opinion, which those of us that read the leaked version and the final version realized they did not do too many revisions. And so, um, obviously, um, most of you are aware of that um, decision, and I really just want to give a brief overview. Um, I have a slide at the end that says Q&A, but to the extent that you have questions, please make it interactive and, and raise your hand, and I'll try my best to answer questions as we go along here. All right. Roe v. Wade, just to give a little bit of background um, on Roe v. Wade, since some of us were not around when that decision came down. Um, in 1970, Jane Roe, which was a fictional name used for a woman in Texas, um, she sued and against Henry Wade, the district attorney of Dallas County, Texas, where she resided, challenging the Texas law, making abortion illegal unless it was for a doctor's orders to save a woman's life. In her lawsuit, Ms. Rowe alleged that the state laws were unconstitutionally vague and abridged her right of personal privacy, protected by the First, Fourth, Fifth, Ninth, and Fourteenth Amendments. In a 7-2 decision authored by Justice Blackman, um, the Supreme Court ruled inherent in the Due Process Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment is a fundamental right to privacy that protects a pregnant woman's choice whether to have an abortion. However, this right is balanced against the government's interests in protecting women's health and protecting the potentiality of human life. The Texas law challenged in this case violated this right. Um, the Supreme Court went on to say that the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment protects against state action, the right to privacy, and a woman's right to choose to have an abortion falls within that right to privacy. A state law that broadly prohibits abortion without respect to the stage of pregnancy or other interests violates that right. Although Texas had legitimate interest in protecting the health of pregnant women and the potentiality of human life, the relative weight of each of these interests varies over the course of the pregnancy and the law must account for this variability. I'm not sure what's going on. I'll give them a minute. Okay. 
good? Okay. In the first trimester of pregnancy, the state may not regulate the abortion decision. Only the pregnant woman of her attending physician can make that decision. The court ruled in the second trimester, the state may impose regulations on abortion that are reasonably related to maternal health. And in the third trimester, um, the court at that time ruled that once the fetus reached the point of viability, the state may regulate abortions or prohibit them entirely so long as the laws contain exceptions for cases when abortion is necessary to save the life or health of the mother. Um, after Roe, um, there was another case that was brought about 20 years afterwards called Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey. And this dealt with some um, legislatures that were putting certain controls on abortion. Um, in Pennsylvania, they had um, added different provisions. And so, for example, they added a law that required informed consent and a 24-hour waiting period prior to any abortion procedure. They also required that a minor seeking an abortion require the consent of one parent, um, which did allow for the, a judicial bypass procedure, which would basically be a petition to the court. And they also... Um, had a provision where a married woman seeking an abortion had to indicate that she had notified her husband of her intention to abort the fetus. And all of these um, provisions were challenged by various abortion clinics and physicians in Pennsylvania. Um, the Federal Appeals Court had upheld these provisions except for the husband notification requirement. And in what was pretty bitter for five to four decision, the court affirmed Roe, but also upheld most of the Pennsylvania provisions. And so for the first time, the justices had opposed what we would then call a new standard on how to determine the validity of laws restricting abortions. Um, the new standard asked whether state abortion regulation had the purpose of imposing an undue burden, which was defined as a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion before the fetus attained viability. Under this standard, the only provision to fail the undue burden test was, again, similar to the appeals court, the husband notification requirement. And in a rare step, you had what was then a, a, a sort of an alliance and an opinion that was crafted really by three justices, Justice O'Connor, Justice Kennedy, and Justice Souter. And so that had been pretty much the standard until Dobbs. Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization um, came down in June of this year, and in this case, Mississippi had passed a law called the Gestational Age Act, and this prohibited all abortions, with few exceptions, after 15 weeks of gestational age. Um, the Jackson Women's Health Organization was the only licensed abortion facility in Mississippi, and one of its doctors filed a lawsuit in federal court challenging the law and requesting a temporary restraining order. After a hearing, the district court granted the TRO while the litigation proceeded to discovery. After discovery, the district court granted the clinic's motion for judgment, summary judgment and had enjoined Mississippi from enforcing the law, finding that the law had not provided evidence that a fetus would be viable at 15 weeks and Supreme Court precedent prohibited states from banning abortions prior to viability and this was affirmed by the Fifth Circuit which sort of set the stage for this going up to the Supreme Court. And if most of you know, the Supreme Court has changed quite a bit in the last three years, with several justices being added to that court who had, at the time they were questioned, said that they would not overturn Roe, or that they had either would not overturn Roe or had not decided what their position would be. And so obviously this was primed for some type of um, variance in what the law was at that point in time. Um, in the Dobbs v. Jackson case, you had an opinion drafted by Justice Alito that went much further than most people had anticipated. Um, the court ruled that the Constitution does not confer a right of ab to abortion and overturned 15-year precedent, precedent with, um, by overturning Roe and Casey. Um, again, Justice Alito authored that opinion, and it went to what we call more of an originalist um, judicial theory, 
where there are certain justices who believe that if it's not in the original constitution, there is no said constitutional right to it. Um, and with that said, Justice Alito rule, um, wrote the decision uh, that said that the constitution does not mention abortion and that the right is not deeply rooted in our history and is therefore um, not an essential component of what he called ordered liberty. Um, the court went through five factors that should be considered in deciding whether a precedent should be overruled um, and supported the overruling of Roe v. Wade and Casey by saying this, the following. Um, they short-circuited the de democratic process, talking about the former court. They lacked a grounding in constitutional text, history, and precedent. The tests they established were not, as they called it, workable. They caused, quote, distortion of law in other areas, and they overruled them, overruling them would not upend what they called concrete reliance interest. Um, Justices Thomas and Kavanaugh concurred in that opinion, and Justice Robert concurred in the judgment, um, uh, and then you had Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan who dissented. I did note um, some language in the opinion that is relevant to the discussion on Prop 3. Um, the opinion stated that abortion presents a profound moral question. The Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated the authority, and the court overrules those decisions and returns the authority to the people and their elected representatives. And so in essence, the Supreme Court was pushing that back to the states to make their individual determinations on what those laws should be. Um, just because we're at the NAACP, I wanted to note that our Justice Thomas, in a concurring opinion, expressed the view that went a little further. He said that um, in future cases, we should reconsider all of the court's substantive due process precedents, including Griswold, which talks about the right to contraception, Lawrence, which talks about the right um, for same-sex relationships, and Obergefell, which talks about same-sex marriage. He stated that because any substantive due process decision is, in his opinion, demonstrably erroneous, we have a duty to correct the error established in those precedents. And that's more of a foreshadowing of what the court may be determining in future decisions as various states may bring additional litigation um, that challenges prior precedents are related to other, what we call civil rights. So, any questions? Covered a lot really quickly. Um, given the political climate, probably quickly, I will say it does take quite a bit of time for decisions to reach the court but my understanding is that there are some already in the quote hopper to be elevated based on various circuits throughout. And so there is certainly a concern in the civil rights community that certain decisions will be affected by this. And so I would call it a re-emphasis on your state advocacy because this decision does push a lot of those decisions back to the state and state legislatures to make sure that those civil rights are ensured in either the constitution or in the laws that are um, put forward in those respective states. Any other questions? Go ahead. So I think the, the biggest difference is that it's a foreshadowing of where the court is. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court is a, an appointed position that's approved by the Senate. And so when, the pres when we choose presidents, if there's a vacancy, they get to appoint someone um, subject to approval by the Senate. 
they stay there quite a bit of time. It's, it's a, a lifetime appointment. And so when you have three justices that were appointed in the last um, presidential term, um, you see the, how the impact can be for several years. And so I think what the decision does do, in particular Justice Thomas's um, commentary, is it shows that to the extent that they are able, um, they can certainly make various decisions in light of how they drafted Dobbs. I mean, we think of it as an overturning of Roe, but they went further than that. They basically said, you don't have a right to privacy. There's no substantive due process protection. Everything, if it's not literally written in the Constitution from you know 250 years ago, then it, you don't have that right. And so I think that's probably what's more concerning is not just the decision itself, but the foreshadowing of where the court is going with respect to all the precedent that has really um, evolved since the civil rights movement. I mean, Justice Thomas, he didn't put Plessy versus Ferguson in there, but he could have. I mean, he could have put a, a lot of Brown versus Board of Education. He could have. I mean, it would have been a little weird coming from a black justice and the only one at the time, but it just is a foreshadowing of what could be done in the future based on, quote, stare decisis or precedent, following precedent. So um, any other questions, Lori? So what, what Dobbs did specifically w with respect to reproductive health is it, in essence, overturned Roe. Um, Griswold is, a, I'll call it a future case that's not really abortion rights, it's right to contraception. But I think Justice Thomas is saying, you know, if you bring it to us, we'll reevaluate and possibly overturn that as well. And so uh, um, that particular decision that does not address it, but what it does say is that all of those decisions are now really with your state legislatures. And, and it's foreshadowing to your state legislatures, if you want to make different laws and revise those laws, you, you, there's certainly opportunity to do so because if it does get challenged and it makes it here, we will possibly um, maintain and overrule those different precedents that affect those rights. And so um, that is pretty much what the concern is, um, especially when you talk about different communities like the LGBTQ community, um, civil rights community, and women's uh, reproductive health um, advocates. They are concerned about sort of the overturning of what those rights are, um, given what we've seen from the court as of late. Any other questions? I like to say no, but yes, they could, yeah. Okay, any other questions before I get into the current law in Michigan? All right. Uh, so um, as a result of Dobbs, um, the law in Michigan has kind of been in flux for the last it's October, so we'll say five months. Um, Michigan does have a 1931 law that bans abortions except to preserve the life of the mother. Um, it's really written in a way to, um, in essence, criminalize doctors who perform abortions in Michigan. And there were two active cases when Dobbs was um, decided um, that talked about um, challenging the enforceability of that law under the Michigan Constitution. The first one is Planned Parenthood, Planned Parenthood versus Nestle, which was filed in the Court of Claims before Judge Gleicher. And that she had initially issued a TRO in May blocking the statute's enforcement. And then there's another lawsuit bought by, brought by Governor Whitmer that was filed in Oakland County Circuit Court with a companion request to the Michigan Supreme Court to answer the constitutional rate constitutional questions raised by that issue. Um, without getting into too much detail, because um, I've been accused of getting into too much detail when it comes to court law cases, 
Um, Judge Gleicher ruled in September last month that the 1931 abortion ban was unconstitutional under the state constitution. She stated in her opinion, our constitution does not permit the legislature to impose unjustifiable burdens on different classes of pregnant women. It also forbids treating pregnant women as unequal to men in terms of their ability to make personal decisions about and when about when and whether to be a parent. And she, at that time, issued a permanent injunction barring the prosecution of the 1931 law and asked that the um, Attorney General Nessel send out a, a notice basically to all the prosecuting attorneys that they could not prosecute the 1931 ban, particularly against um, doctors. Um, and so this is sort of what the current state is um, pending um, the Court of Appeals, Michigan Court of Appeals did receive a request for immediate consideration to overturn that decision. They said that they did not see their reason for immediate consideration. So at this point in time, that is the injunction that's in place until after the election. I believe it's in place till at least November 21st. Um, and so obviously Proposal 3 um, will have been determined um, whether or not that was passed by um, our citizens or, not, citizens or not on November 8th, and so um, it will be obviously important to know um, before the court reviews any further um, pleadings on this particular decision. Um, proposal um, 3 is pretty straightforward, but also very broad. It goes beyond abortion rights. Um, this is what you will see on the ballot. This is the language that was approved by the Board of Canvassers and um, was put on the ballot after a petition to the Supreme Court because the Board of Canvassers did deadlock two to two and refused to put it on there. Um, it states the proposal to, the amend, to amend the state constitution to establish new individual rights to reproductive freedom, including right to make all decisions about pregnancy and abortion, allow state to regulate abortion in some cases, and forbid prosecution of individuals exercising that established right. Um, it goes on to state that this proposed constitutional amendment would establish new individual right to reproductive freedom, including right to make and carry out all decisions about pregnancy, such as prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion, miscarriage management, and infertility. It also um, will allow state to regulate abortion after fetal viability, but not prohibit it if medically needed to protect a patient's life or physical or mental health. Um, it forbids state discrimination in enforcement of this right and it prohibits prosecution of an individual or a person helping a pregnant individual from exercising rights established by this amendment and it invalidates state laws that conflict with this amendment. Um, I took some of the um, information from the Citizens Research Council, which is a nonpartisan um, organization that does do summaries of our ballot initiative proposals and it, just to make it very clear because I know there's going to be a panel that will answer questions and I want to steal their thunder. Um, if Proposal 3 is adopted, according to the Citizens Research Council of Michigan, the fundamental right to reproductive health care for matters related to pregnancy, including access to abortion prior to the stage of viability, would be guaranteed to all individuals by the Michigan Constitution. Once established, this right would be protected from most legislative efforts to modify it. So that is something that will um, counter the effects of Dobbs. If Proposal 3 is rejected, regulatory decisions regarding reproductive health, including abortion, will revert to the state courts and legislature. And Michigan courts have currently, are currently addressing that, as I've stated before, whether the Michigan statute prohibiting abortion does in fact violate the Constitution and currently the rule is that it does not, but obviously that is subject to appeal. Major issues to consider. Um, proposal three would not only preserve the right to abortion that had been federally protected under Roe. It will also potentially expand access to abortion to later stages of pregnancy, lift certain restrictions that have previously been in place and establish additional rights to a wider range of reproductive health services. 
While abortion legislation has been known to have positive effects on women in society, the impact of this expansion of rights is unknown. If the proposal language is broad and largely as the proposal's language is broad and largely undefined, even if passed, it will likely face quite a bit of litigation and legal challenges. And if it fails, the Michigan Supreme Court may still find a constitutional right to abortion under our state constitution, but that li right will likely be much narrower than what Proposal 3 offers. Furthermore, while um, without any constitutional protections, Michigan laws and reg um, regulations on abortion will be left again to the state legislative process. Currently, Michigan's abortions laws are among the strictest in the country, but their enforcement by local state prosecutors does vary widely across the state. In fact, you've had certain prosecutors in various jurisdictions say that they will not um, prosecute under 1931 law, even if it is ruled to be constitutional. Um, the existing statute on abortion, which is among the stricting, strictest, is again currently being challenged in the state court. Any other questions? All right, thank you. If there are no questions, thank you very much, Kalila. You may remember that earlier I talked about the fact that the NAACP is partnering with Wayne County Community College District to put on this law school. We are very, very, very pleased and honored to be able to be in this building and put forth this program. So I want to ask Brian Singleton, who is the president of the downtown campus of WC3, if you would just come forward and say a few words for us. being here today, very important, very, the topics that you're getting are just amazing. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, poke my head in the very first session, and I said, oh, I wish I would have signed up for this, because the energy in the room, the information that was given is something that I think is so desperately needed, um, not just today, but every day. Um, and I, challenge, I would challenge all of you to do what I plan on doing, is to talking to Ms. Uh, uh, Lloyd uh, in the back, and asking her, can we make this something that is a regular. Uh, I think this is done every once in a while, every year, annually, and uh, I would ask, maybe we can even develop a partnership to where it's done, where when you're bringing attorneys like Attorney Spencer and some of the uh, other attorneys that were here at the other sessions on a regular basis, they let our community and our students be able to learn from it. Uh, not everyone it may go into the field, not everyone feels capable of going into f the field, but having the reassurance, uh, having that information is so critically important. Again, this was just the very first day that I uh, poked my head in to, to give the welcome, and, and uh, I did not want to leave. Uh, um, so uh, this is official. I am asking that we <laughs> extend this as best we can, extend the partnership, and I want to say thank you all for being here and welcome. On behalf of the Chancellor, Dr. Curtis L. Ivory, and the Board of Trustees, we welcome you to the De Curtis L. Ivory downtown campus, and we ask that you show us that you know that we're welcoming you by coming back again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I, I want to thank you, and I want to assure you that we will be back soon. Now we're going to have a panel discussion touching upon many of the issues that were just addressed by our presenter, uh, attorney Kalila Spencer. So if you're a panelist and in the room, would you please come forward and take a seat here at the table? And I'm gonna ask Kevin Tolbert, who is our vice president of the Detroit branch NAACP, if he would be so kind as to come forward and moderate this discussion. Any, any seat you want. First come, first serve. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you, Chewy, for the introduction. And I am honored to be here at the George Crockett Community Law School. What a great name, what a great honor, and a great opportunity in our city 
to spread knowledge and information and discuss all the important factors that take place into having what's most important uh, understanding of the law and uh, justice. Justice is important and uh, making sure that all have an equal opportunity is something that our NAACP has had a strong hand in and under the great leadership of the Reverend Dr. Wendell Anthony, we have been out in the community for years doing these type of things. So it's awesome. Uh, welcome to our guest online as well who's watching. And we look forward to a great discussion, a great discussion on the issues. Um, joining us today, we have some very talented and intelligent people uh, who will be on our panel. I'd like to just give a brief introduction quickly. I know that we have the bios uh, in there, but I will start with, um, I'm going to start with Ms. Crystal Kennard. Ms. Kennard is a single mother of two and has a degree from business management at Morgan State University. She's currently working for Ann Arbor Public Schools as a community assistant. Um, and she looks forward to joining our panel and uh, addressing some important topics. So welcome to our panel, Ms. Kennard. Uh, to, next to Ms. Kennard is none other than someone I've known for a long time, and it says he brings 15 years of experience developing in data and intelligence systems. Uh, I would beg to differ and say Brandon Jessup brings a whole lot more than that. Um, as one of our most intelligent and forthright thinkers, uh, he has played a role in a lot of politics, uh, the NAACP, and many other initiatives, but I would be remiss if I didn't say he is also a great friend, an uh, excellent father, and someone I've known for some time. So uh, welcome in this official capacity, sir. And then next to you, I don't even know where to begin uh, and what title to assign to Ms. Darcy McConnell, uh, but I will say this. If there is a fight, if there is something about doing the right thing, if there is a leader that you're looking for, you will always find Darcy McConnell right there up at the front. Uh, I've known you two for uh, many, many years. I dare to even uh, guess how many it is at this point, but I do know throughout your storied career as a journalist, uh, leading your own public relations firm, and even as a candidate, you have been an outstanding voice for those in our community, and I know you'll continue to do such going forward. So <clears throat> with that introductions out of the way, uh, we have an opportunity now to have a discussion about some of the topics that we've been discussing this morning. Uh, and we get a chance to hear from our STEAM panel. My job is to facilitate the discussions, not and get in the way of them. Uh, hopefully I do a good job of that. So the first thing I want to do is um, pose a question to our panel. Uh, the participants will take about a minute apiece to answer. But before we do that, actually let me back up and let you all just give a quick opening statement of about a minute, uh, just what you think about the issues and uh, what you're here to discuss. So I'll start with you, Crystal. Hi. Yeah, you probably wanna bring a little closer. Hi, I am opposed to proposal three. It is very confusing and it is extreme. If you read the original proposal, you can read it three, four times. I don't know how many times you're gonna read it, but you will be confused. And I have talked to people who are confused and who've said, I don't understand it. So I am opposed because it is extreme and it is confusing. Thank you. Mr. Jessup. Um, yeah, Mike. Yo, yo, okay, here we go, here we go, there we go. Um, Brandon Jessup. Uh, in and thank you, Kevin, for for that glowing introduction. <laughs> when your brother introduces you, it's kind of tough to, you just gotta accept it. Um, I'm in support of Proposal 3. Um, I'm very concerned about the steps that overturning Roe presents in when we talk about privacy, um, it's especially being a, a father, a husband, uh, but a person that works in the technical space and has been working for in 20 plus years in civic engagement and civil rights community specifically, um, the steps that brought this up earlier, it's not on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
that's this is on. Um, so again, I'm in support of Proposal 3, simply because the, the climate that the Supreme Court has put in place by overturning Roe versus Wade um, challenges the right to privacy for black folks specifically. It definitely challenges women's equality in a post-civil rights space. When we talk about education and some of the conservative pushes across the country, against what some folks call the CRT. You can also see the same political steps happening at the local level. You see folks such as the Proud Boys now running for, for school districts and then burning books that specifically talk about race, that talk about feminism and, <clears throat> and womanism, and, and, and build that kind of advocacy and agency post-civil rights, right? So I think when we talk about the climate that the Supreme Court has put in place, that they're looking to turn back the clock with small chips like this. And in a new digital aspect, and we try to decide on how we manage new technologies and how they, uh, and how they impact our social life, how they impact our well-being and our daily, in our daily lives, it's very dangerous to be able to set national precedents and tones around technology. So once again, when we start talking about this turning back the clock on our privacy, we also have to remember that technology continues to move forward, and we need to have the agency and the, and the credibility to be able to see what our forefathers did not see 250 some odd years ago. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Darcy McConnell. I'm the communication director for the Reproductive Freedom for All campaign. I'm grateful for ha to have this opportunity to tell you exactly what Proposal 3 is and does because the opposition it will, will not tell you, one, that what they really want is to turn back the clock to 1931. That's the law that will go into place if we don't say yes on three. And the 1931 law says that uh, essentially bans abortions in all cases, including cases of rape, cases of incest, and threats to the woman's health. I find it peculiar that you can say it's both confusing and extreme at the same time. <laughs> Either you read it and were confused by it or you are saying it's too extreme. The reality is it's neither one of those, it's simple. The Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Those protections are gone and we need to vote yes on three to restore Roe in Michigan. So I hope that people appreciate the groups that are most impacted by this if we don't. The mortal morbidity rate for African Americans will be the most extreme uh, if we don't pass Proposal 3. Um, reproductive health, access to reproductive health and care is critical for our community. Um, these decisions need to remain between women and their doctors, that's it. When you go to the doctor, you don't invite your elected official to sit <laughs> in the room with you. It's you and your doctor. So I'm strongly urging people to disregard the noise, the confusion that they're trying to instill on the other side, and vote yes on Proposal 3. Thank you, Darcy. And we do have one more panelist that I need to introduce, uh, Ms. Maia Noni Anthony, uh, who is also the chair of our Health and Wellness Committee at the Detroit branch of the NAACP. She as well comes with a lifetime of experience uh, and currently, she's a council member for the Pope Francis Center, the largest vegan nonprofit in the state, as well as Veg Michigan, Fannie Lou Hamer Political Action Committee, and many more. So uh, thank you, Maya, for joining us, and we look forward to you adding to discussion. Thank I'm you. gonna give a quick uh, opening statement as it relates to Proposal 3. Sure, absolutely. I love how everybody looks at me and smiles when they hear the word vegan. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, here today. I'm here because um, I believe, let me grab this, I believe that reproductive health care, including access to birth control uh, and safe legal abortion care, is an essential part of, you know, our health and well-being. Um, I represent as well um, for our future Michigan. I'm the regional field director there. Uh, I have teams out right now, today, this moment. I, I just left turf. Um, and I have organizers out canvassing door to door. 
uh, organizing digitally, they've been doing that all year, and phone banking all year. Um, since March to today, we've canvassed over 207,000 doors. We were out there, thank you, Darcy, we were out there having conversations, talking to voters about their issues and concerns and uh, what matters most to them. Um, close to 1,900, and I, excuse me, I have notes, I wanna make sure I don't miss a beat here. Um, close to 1,900 voters have placed the Supreme Court, access to healthcare, pro-choice and abortion rights amongst their top issues. Uh, the proposal is important to a lot of people, uh, but there are still more people who need to be educated on the matter and they need to know that, you know, this is another issue, but that they have a right to vote early to speak to that matter. Um, but folks don't understand that proposal three, um, what it really sig signifies. Um, it's just a common sense solution to restore our rights, you know, under Roe. Uh, it's detrimental to vote yes. I mean, excuse me, it's detrimental to not vote no. Um, it's essential to vote yes. Um, and I, I think that, you know, we'll cover a lot here, but um, mainly it's to get out and reach the people because there is some confusion, some fusion out here that voting no on three is the right thing. And, and so we need to definitely do the opposite of that for our health. Thank you. So thank you all for your opening statements. Um, at this time, we'd like to pose a question to you. And I'm going to start with you, Darcy, uh, especially I didn't give your official title, which is the Communications Director for the Reproductive Freedom for All campaign. So I'd like for you to answer the question, if the Michigan 1931 abortion law goes into effect and is in force, what are some of the potential effects that it will have on abortion rights? Sure, we're already seeing some of the potential effect. Um, Michigan, of course, is not an anomaly when it relates to reverting to antiquated laws on reproductive rights. So we are seeing an influx of individuals from other states who cannot access reproductive care. And the way that the 1931 law functions, you essentially have to be near death to get care. And that's a very subjective, subjective parameter. So a doctor doesn't know what to do. Uh, we had a webinar with four doctors who essentially said just that. So we are looking at, at a, a, a ban on abortions, even in cases of rape and incest, as well as threats to the woman's health. It also means limited access or no access to the reproductive care that you need. And as I pointed out earlier, a disproportionate impact on persons of color. So these are all the things that would be a domino effect if the 1931 ban uh, were to, to go into effect. So we're already seeing the impact, um, threats to prosecute doctors for taking care of patients, uh, people being near death to get care, um, confusion about what kind of uh, support can be provided. So I, I was talking to a minister yesterday and he said, I don't know, he said, there wasn't much good happening for me in 1931. So I don't think we want to go back to something that was crafted in 1931 that certainly didn't have us in mind. Thank you. Uh, would you like to uh, answer the same question, please, Crystal? Um, if that law goes into effect, what do you believe the potential effects will have on uh, reproductive rights for women in the state and those affected by it? I believe. I believe that women still will have rights. Um, I don't believe that black women of color uh, will be denied health care. If it is a matter of life and death, no doctor is going to make you have that baby because we can deliver that baby and the baby can survive, okay? So I don't agree with that and I think that uh, we're saying that we're gonna go back in time, but we're not gonna go back in time because we're talking about saving lives. We don't talk about um, what happens when these women do have the so-called medical care that they're supposed to have. And um, we're not talking about uh, Cree who passed away and um, did go to Planned Parenthood. No one's talking about her. 
So we're gonna keep things safe for women. You will not be denied health care. So it's your position, you will not be denied health care under the, if proposal two pass, passes, three, I'm sorry, proposal three passes. Uh, would you like to respond and answer the same question as well, Mr. Jessup? You know, I, I, don't, I don't try to be the legal scholar here. Um, <clears throat> but if we just look at the impacts of when the Constitution, or when the Supreme Court stands on the 10th Amendment of states' rights, and most of us remember the last 10 years of being in Detroit and the takeover of Detroit, the bankruptcy of Detroit, the bankruptcy of Flint, the Flint water crisis. All of those actions were taken under the 10th Amendment, under states' rights. So now what the Supreme Court has said is that, well, hey, you know what? This whole conversation about contraception, women's access to care, <coughs> is back to the states. So let's think about it. Okay. So I, in my own experience as a father, and walking with my wife through the process of, of giving birth to our daughter and also my son, who's now at DAPS up, uh, around the corner up the street a little bit, <coughs> When we talk about access to care, the conversation of finding a, a doula for my wife, because we wanted to make sure that we had a more natural birthing process for my daughter, was absolutely horrible. Now, having to navigate that <coughs> with insurance was helpful, okay? Having a state that had no <coughs> arbitrary uh, restrictions to how we access birth, birthing and childhood and mother and maternity care made a whole lot of sense. So when we talk about what Roe versus Wade does, it makes it unclear about how we would access those types of processes. So now, insurance companies now can walk you through a very gray area and say, you know what, since we don't know whether or not this is legal, we can't cover it. So now, the cost of more natural birthing processes, which much what more, more African American folks seek, and in, in when we talk about building families, when we talk about <clears throat> um, women having access, to, to breastfeeding uh, support and things like that, those things are already very hard to get to now. So do you really trust this same legislature that has worked very hard these last two years to restrict your right to vote to now turn around and listen to your voice when it's time to figure out what to do post row They won't have the time. So it's more important to codify things like this as a constitutional right, the same thing we did with voting in 2018, because who would have known what we would have had in 2020 without the right to access to an absentee ballot in a pandemic? Right. So we have to act proactively in advance of what folks will do in their own spaces. Okay, we're talking about some of the same folks who think that remote care, that, 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 that proposal three is absolutely not the way to go. Folks that want to vote no on this, these are the folks who also live in communities that are closing hospitals. In Georgia right now, there are what? I think it's 38 maternal hospitals for 85 counties. Black women's access to health care is, I think, is one, one doctor for every 83 women. Black women in Georgia. We are scared to look at those numbers in Michigan in a very real way. So once again, we have to sometimes act in that action of pre precaution because we know sometimes governments don't act in their best access for us. Thank you. Uh, Maya? Sure. <laughs> As the chair of the Health and Wellness Committee, um, I host meetings every third, <clears throat> excuse me, Tuesday. And last year in September, um, I, I, Kevin might have been there, <clears throat> excuse me, but I talked to the committee about Texas, <laughs> and that's kind of where a lot of things start, right, down, you know, down south, um, but it was Senate Bill number eight, which is considered the trigger law also. Um, I said, well, you know, this is something that we need to look at. I told the, the executive committee that too. I said, y'all need, we need to look at this because Governor Greg Abbott signed uh, this, you know, bill into law that will essentially allow um, private citizens to hold accountable, uh, you know, people, uh, uh, young ladies or women who essentially have to, for, uh, health reasons or for whatever issues, they will hold them accountable 
um, and ban them from getting abortions, even if they are raped. This is the initial bill. This is what it was initially saying. It was written to enable these private citizens to, to, to form lawsuits against doctors that would assist them, nurses that would check them in, um, people that would even you know assist in driving them to these uh, places where they could get this procedure done to better their health. Um, and so it was uh, because of the, um, um, what did I say? Um, now I think that they they uh, they went to the Supreme Court. That's what I'm trying to say. Went through the Supreme Court, and now there's a, a six week mark. Um, I still think that that should not be a decision that legislators should make. If you are in me being a, a single woman, if I am ever, God forbid, in a situation where I have to, you know, make a decision, I don't want no man telling me what to do with my body. I don't want anybody telling me what to do with my body. It is my right, my choice. This is what people decide to do. This is what people are saying they want the right to do. What is, what is the problem with instilling that constitutional right? Why vote no? Okay, so how about I ask the questions? <laughs> Thank you for your response. It makes me angry to even have this conversation. This is ridiculous, but yes. Okay, I t um, so if you are in favor, and I'm gonna ask you this, uh, Crystal, uh, if you're in favor of the 1931 ban, should it be amended at all to make provisions of the case of girls or women who become pregnant due to rape, incest, or women with non-viable pregnancies? Um. I will have to say, I'm gonna say no on rape because 79 years ago, my grandmother was raped and the only child she had was my mother. And my mother had six children. And out of those six children, one had seven children, one had two, one had two, one had two, and then now we have a great grandson, a great, she has a great grandson. So if my grandmother would not have had my mother, I would not be sitting here and all of those others would not be doing what they're doing. My brother right now is a black pilot for a well-known company. He wouldn't be doing what he's doing, and he has inspired other young men to become pilots. He was in the military. So if my grandmother would have chosen to abort my mother, I wouldn't be here and all of us wouldn't be here. It's a generation, it's not just that one baby. So I would say no for rape, now, under the circumstances of you being incest, that's a different story. But I will say definitely no to rape. Uh, so no for rape or incest. What do you believe about women with non-viable pregnancies? So you will not be held accountable to have a baby if you can't carry, okay, let me get it right. So. Viability has been cha will be changed in this law, okay? If the baby is born um, and it needs help, it will not be able to get help. We have babies who are preemies now, who uh, we know a lot of people who've had preemies, and um, those babies have been taken care of. And also uh, to to say that um, when you miscarriage, because I just want to put this out there, when you miscarriage, we say I lost my baby. But on that same hand, when we don't want that baby, we don't call it a baby. So I'm a little concerned about that. But viability, you know, it's important. We will not uh, let a woman, uh, let me get it right here. If you have an ectopic pregnancy, we will not let you have that baby because the baby and you will die. And if you have a miscarriage, you are going to have to have a DNC. I've had friends who have had miscarriages and you have a DNC and we're not killing the baby because the baby is already dead. So in this instance, it was about policy. Ms. McConnell, you wanna respond on from a policy perspective? Sure, well first I just wanna clear up some misinformation that was just given out. Um, 
viability does not change under this. These are the same parameters that we had under Roe v. Wade. So that is an, another um, misleading, unfactual statement from the opposition that I just wanted to clarify. So that does not change. This restores the protections that we had under Roe v. Wade. We recovered federally. Once the federal protections went away, it, we are looking at the 1931 law. So this is so avoid reverting to 1931. So that doesn't change. That was uh, not accurate. I'm curious. It's mind-boggling to hear that um, rape, if someone's raped, they wouldn't have this option available to them, that she's supportive of that. Um, basically, you want to potentially re-victimize someone who has survived one, a really horrific experience. As to ectopic pregnancy, what we're talking about is a situation uh, where the baby's in the fallopian tubes. Um, or a baby cannot survive or is developing abnormally. So a doctor told a really gruesome story about a baby who was born whose head fully didn't develop. So the, the treatment that was needed medically is considered an abortion. So people need to have those options available to them for extreme circumstances. So the policy question is either the opposition wants us to go back to a near all ban, or we say yes to sustain the reproductive rights, the rights we had under Roe for nearly 50 years. Can I ask a question? Um, so with... <laughs> I, I want you to respond to the uh, question here as it relates to... Um, if, um, clearly you're not in favor of the 1931 ban, um, and so what type of provision should be made uh, to ensure uh, women who become pregnant with uh, rape, incest, or non-viable pregnancies. Well, it sounds like they want them to co-parent with their rapists. So I want to know what it, what are the next steps if they're not able to if 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 someone if a child is raped and she's not able to get an abortion. What happens once the baby is born? Um, it's particularly if it's in a community where, you know, they don't have the resources, they don't have the equity to, you know, take care of the family in that situation. I, I, I wonder, you know, what happens to, to you know, the, the, the person that, you know, is raped and has to have this child? Ms. Kanari, would you like to respond? You may give that baby up for adoption. There are plenty of people who want a child. So she has to still go through the birth and, and so, reliving. So, so my thing is this. You only go through that for nine months, and then you give that baby away. No one ever tells you that when you choose to abort that baby, you not only deal with being raped again, but you also deal with the pain and suffering that you went through having that abortion. Question. Here. I basically had um, a comment, and what I wanted to say is that I had the unfortunate Am I on? experience of um, a miscarriage in the very early stages. And at that time, I was at work unaware of the fact that I had an embryo, not a baby. Because what I do know is that there are stages of development. And with stages of development, we have an embryo, we have a fetus, and technically speaking, from a developmental standpoint, it's not considered a baby until after it's born. But nevertheless, the time I had this experience, it was prior to Roe v. Wade. And what I had to do once I was told to go to the hospital and take this with you, take this with you, and take this with you. And based on that, that is what the doctor had to use to cover himself so that I could be taken care of. I'd hate to have anyone have to go through that, whether it is by choice or whether it is a circumstance where nature took care of things. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, shift the conversation quickly because I want to. I have a question here that was proposed. Uh, so we heard earlier mention the fact, and this law is from 1931, 
And uh, we talk about not going back to a time like that. Do you all respond? I'll go in order here. Um, this law was created in 31. Do you believe that race or class or religious factors should be considered uh, if the laws were to be implemented? Uh, I want to start with you, Mr. Jesse. <clears throat> no, rights for all are rights for all. Period. I, I, I think that's the situation. If, if we want to begin setting standards, I believe we should probably look at ways we can set standards for so rights to privacy. Um, especially, you know, some of the laws that you've seen other states enact, like the bounty laws, um, those types of things, like they, they incur some of the worst in our society. And you will be really surprised like how some folks in Virginia have been acting um, with some of these bounty laws on education and CRT. Uh, you'd be surprised to hear like how some of these hotlines in Texas have been operating with folks with the potential of running a $10,000 or $30,000 bounty on folks who potentially may have seeked an abortion and things like that. See, these are the things that happen when you have you know, turning back the clock. Because remember, there used to be bounties to find young men that was my age and my height and my size, right, because of my worth in the field. So I think it's very clear <coughs> the mentality when folks look to seek to turn back the clock in that space. And, and, and prior to, with the founders of this Constitution in this country, race was considered was a political tool. And I think that our new laws need to try to find ways to equate that and, and fix that wrong. Would anyone else like to respond to that question? I just wanted to make a couple points. Um, one that I pointed out earlier, obviously uh, the disproportionate impact that this could have on um, individuals, particularly African Americans. I also wanted to note that um, People of many different faiths support access to reproductive care. Um, there is actually a group called Catholics for Choice. Um, there are many clergy who have signed on in support of Proposal 3 because faith teaches us to respect one another. And um, that includes um, people making their own individual decisions. So I just wanted to make note of those things as it relates to a yes vote on Proposal 3. I also do think it's essential to consider grant programs for clinics, um, you know, resources that um, outline protections for health, just in general, um, like healthcare personnel as well, and um, just reinforcing these legal protections for pregnant individuals, particularly in communities of color. I'm going to say that because black communities are lacking resources. We are the ones who will be experiencing, you know, the brunt of something like this if it were to pass. So it's very important to follow through, you know, not only securing proposal three, but implementing new protections that continue to reinforce and give our you know, children and children's children, the equity, the healthcare equity that they need in order you know, to, to not have to deal with this. Ms. Kennard, you'd like to respond to that? I would, like to, I would like to say that we have clinics now, the pregnancy health clinics, if they would stop bombing and destroying them that are helping our women, and they are in our communities. So we do have that help. And when women are given that option, they do come to our clinics. Mr. Jessup, you want to respond? You know, I, um, I, I focused on like some of the, the worst parts of 1930 women, my sister, and both of these sisters brought up good points. And yes, but I, I want to talk about the healthcare part and the access part in the, in the spaces where federally you will see Congress fight over whether or not we give certain monies to Medicare and Medicaid and, and the Affordable Care Act. Well, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 was gutted to make sure that programs like this would not be funded well, or at least funded to the capacity of what they're needed, right? The census that we just took showed that we are already underserving black women in Wayne County specifically. And so we've just seen this current legislature in Congress vote against expansions. 
So what happens? Now we have this overburden on the faith community to provide service as if it's really your personal service back to the community. That's not right in a country that generates $20 trillion of wealth every year. That makes no sense. So, so once again, the people who are telling you no, the folks who think that this is not the way to go, they often speak on the opposite side when you ask for the funding that you know that is resourced in this country, that we have begun to expect as a right in this country. So they consistently underfund you, and then when you ask for it in writing, they say you can't do it and you don't deserve it. What part of democracy is that? That's what, you, that's what poor folks fail, fail safe is, is democracy. When you know you don't have enough money to access the things that you need, and when the church's doors are closed because they don't have enough money to do the things that you've asked them to do for the community, democracy is what you have left. So when you cannot access that, because remember, Proposal 2 talks about enfranchising early voting and making sure that we don't count things ahead of time because someone wants to declare victory early. See? They're telling you no on two and they tell you no on three. Mm -hmm. How many times they keep telling you no when you're asking them to put something on paper for you? Let's just say yes. So right, so you need to say yes, and then we have to hold these folks accountable when they go to Washington in January and they talk about the budget and how much it costs. How much did your yes cost? Okay, your yes cost you cost us trillions of dollars, and they shortchange you trillions. They shortchange you trillions. They shortchange you trillions. Not only is it gutted, Brandon but it is sitting on the desks of legislators for months after months after months. We call them, we call voters to tell voters to tell them to release funds so that we can use them in our healthcare system when people are thinking we have enough in the community. Just now, just now the governor of Florida decided to do what? De to deny federal assistance for a hurricane. Why? Because he didn't want to pay the bill back to states for using their National Guard. What in the world does that sense make? It makes no sense. And Georgia right now denies billions of dollars of Medicare because they don't want to do what? Accept federal dollars off of because of political standing. The worst, the, <clears throat> the, country, the state in this country that receives the most federal aid. Mississippi has been denying billions of dollars in infrastructure care because of their own political stances and they let their state capital drink lead for six months. Six months. And they brought in porta potties for the legislators. But the black folks who serviced those porta potties had to go back and drink lead. Now hold on, how much sense does this make? But they want to tell you, you can't have access to condoms, brothers. You know, that's a good point, Brandon. Do you think, do you think that this abortion uh, law from 1931 would uh, block access to birth control, such as morning after pills or any other contraceptive services? I think it'd be a very hard court fight because the, the medical industry would not let you just take the products off the shelves. It's, it's shown that, that contraceptives are a billion dollar industry. And so, and, but not only just that, like providing contraceptives for free through federal programming has reduced the number of STIs and, ST, and STDs spread throughout the country. And the world, once again, whatever we don't use, we send it across the, across the globe. So guess what, all those extra rubbers and things like that and, and condoms and Plan B pills, whatever else, guess what, they're probably gonna end up somewhere else in this, in this, on, this, on this globe that, that wants them, that culture accepts them, okay? This isn't being pushed out onto folks. We're talking about cultural acceptances. So once again, right, like when you talk about over there, the good things we do here impact the world. So I think we need to consider these things for, just for men, period. Not only just men who aspire to be rich, but for men that want to be responsible. Ms. Kennard, could you answer that question? Do you think the 1931 abortion ban would uh, block access to plan, plan B or morning after pills or other contraceptive services if it was to be in effect here in Michigan? Well, first of all, that Plan B pill, they don't tell you when you take that pill at home. These women call on the phone, they talk to a doctor, they get the pill. So you don't know how far along that woman is 
if it's an ectopic pregnancy, you don't have any clue. And then she's at home by herself going through this all by herself. No one tells you the stories of these women sitting there on the toilet in excruciating pain, blood all over the place. And then you still have to end up going to have an abortion because that baby was not expelled. So they don't tell you the whole story. That is not a pill that you should just be given without going to see your doctor. So it's your position so, it would block so it? So I don't, I, I believe it would be, pat, that would not be appropriate to have. I'm gonna say no, I've heard too many horror stories. Ms. McConnell, can you respond? Sure, so I think we are hearing at least a recurring theme um, from the opposition. One, misinformation, right? They, they never let the facts get in the way of a good story about what really would happen here. I should mention that it actually preceded uh, 1931 in terms of the original genesis of this, of this. so we were actually talking about the 1800s. Um, but that pill is an important part of reproductive health that the opposition would deny folks access to. Um, ectopic pregnancies, when they need the medical care, would be denied under this. Um, all of the important aspects that you, uh, tools that you need to access during a pregnancy would be bridled by this 1931 law. And remember again, the standard is a woman near death. And that's a subjective standard. So I literally had a doctor say, so are we waiting for them to rupture and bleed out and say, okay, they're gonna die now so we can inter intercede? So we are talking about an extreme reversal uh, uh, on every act, part of reproductive health care. These things would all be diminished and bridled by the 1931 law. So again, just to be clear, if there's any confusion, we need people to say yes to Proposal 3, which appears as 22-3 on your ballot. Turn your ballot over. Don't turn back the clock. Ms. Kennard. So as I stated before, if you have an ectopic pregnancy, the baby will not survive, and you will die also. So we will not let you have that baby. So that is not true. That is one of the myths that they are saying. No woman can survive an ectopic pregnancy, and the baby cannot either. So we do have doctors who have said there is a procedure that you can do that's humane, and you don't have to have an abortion. The baby is removed appropriately in a humane way. But does the law, that 1931 law, say that? Because it appears that that 1931 law doesn't provide that level of protection. I know you're saying that no one would allow it to happen, but does the law, if we revert back to that? So again, that protection would be there because you can't live. So why would we, do, why would we kill you and your baby? Yeah, I think the question, if you would like to respond, Miss, Miss Anthony, um, the, the, the question is, does the law provide that protection, though? Because it seems to be unclear. Is it on there, yes or no? I mean, I still haven't heard yes or no. Uh, if it's not on there, then, 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 then it clearly it won't put the, the protections in place. And it will change, and it will reverse it. Period. Yeah. Pardon, pardon me, Kevin. We have a question in the chat. Hi, yes, the question in the chat um, is directed to Ms. Kennard, and they want to ask, why won't preemies be able to get health care? Okay, because they have stated in here, excuse me, they have, they have stated in here, fetal liability means the point in pregnancy when the, the professional judgment of an, an attending health care professional and based based on the prenatal facts of the case, there is sufficient likelihood that the fetus sustains sustain survival outside of the uterus without application of extraordinary medical measures. So that's what it would take away. It would take away the extraordinary medical measures. That's, again, Never let the facts in the way of a good story. It's factually inaccurate. The fetal viability standard that would come back under Proposal 3 is what we have under Roe v. Wade. The only thing that's impacted, so what I mentioned before, these extreme circumstances when a woman um, has a horrific medical situation, like we just discussed, maybe the head's not developing, something just really 
horrific that they have to face. And the proposal allows for a doctor to intervene as they should. So you can keep saying things to try and make it seem real, but these are not facts that you are providing. What your side wants is to ban all abortions, to return to the 1931 law. It'd be better if you were just honest about that than to just make up these fantastic stories. Okay. So this proposal restores the, the protections that we had under Roe, the reproductive rights that we had under Roe, the rights that we enjoyed for 50 years, keeps the decision between women and their doctors. You know, interesting before you respond, um, I am a father of twin boys. And I remember when uh, their mom was pregnant, the, um, she had a uh, miscarriage. Uh, they performed the DNC and removed um, the fetus. But she became violently sick. And uh, fast forward um, a few months of many doctors not being able to determine what was going on, uh, I took her to uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And, um, they discovered that it was actually uh, what the doctor described as more uh, birth material left behind. And so they performed a second DNC. Uh, and as it turns out later, we learned that they were actually twins. So they removed the first fetus the first time and not looking for the second fetus. Interestingly enough, I was curious, so I reached out to the doctor. He said on the current, uh, if the current ban um, on abortion was in effect, that although they probably would have been able to do the first DNC, it would have took extreme measures for her to be able to have had two DNCs which would have looked like abortions in such a short amount of time. And so I think the concern and my question to you, Ms. Kennard, is why are we allowing politicians to move into a space that be, should be for doctors and women? Um, how would, what would be your response to that? I, I would say that we're not having politicians, and if you're truly saying that it's between a woman and her doctor, then why is it when you go to the clinic, Planned Parenthood, the doctor doesn't even look you in the face and have a conversation before you have that abortion? Well, remember, this is a policy discussion, and I think you're talking about some personal things there that that's not really the, uh, we would be here all day and couldn't have an intelligent conversation. Okay. So I want to keep it high level, and what I mean is, from a policy perspective, um, what we're talking about then is politicians getting a right to decide specifically each step in the example that I gave, and that seems to be unfair. Um, so, so I would say to you that that is unfair. You're absolutely right, because the doctor needed to make sure that with an ultrasound, he would have been able to check and make sure that both babies were removed. And so I think that when you're saying politicians are doing this or politicians are doing that, when you have one, especially those who are doctors who are well educated and know the process, they would tell you that you do have to have all of the miscarriage removed. Uh, I'm gonna move on from this, but I'll simply say, I know we got another question here. Um, in the particular example that I described, it was unique in that multiple ultrasounds had been done and no one had been able to determine there was more birth material there. It was a specific ultrasound that was done at the University of Michigan. So medical science is such a complex thing that politicians can't always describe every entity. And so in this instance though, and this is one of the rare instances in which now we're saying politicians should have input on what someone does with their body. But we heard all throughout the pandemic many people objecting to that and saying, oh, a politician won't tell me what to do with my body. But I know we have a question here uh, from the floor. Can we take that this time? Hi, this question would be for Ms. Kennard. Um, earlier on, you had stated that Proposal 3 um, was very unclear. It was mm -hmm. very confusing. So what about within the proposal? Because I've seen some commercials as well. Yes. And that's what made me I was here today for school, but mm -hmm. I stopped in when I seen you guys here on the abortion rights. So can you kind of elaborate a little bit with what's so, in the proposal that? So what I'm gonna say is that when they say every individual, mm -hmm. so that doesn't put an age limit on anything. So that means that any child can go and have procedures done without their parents' knowledge. 
It also says um, on sterilization, I, my child could go and have this procedure done without my knowledge. Another adult could take them. So my concern is, one is, is that there's no age on there. It doesn't say that adults or women or anything like that. It, it's very vague on who they're referring to. It does not specify, and we do have information for you to read the amendment itself. But, and I think, um, go ahead. No, I was gonna say, because up under Roe versus Wade, there is age restrictions. And Correct. Please. Right. Correct. So, so what she's so saying, it it, that, <clears throat> it's on. It's on. Uh, parental consent does not change under Proposal Three. Again, this is a distraction uh, to muddle things to make you second guess. This restores the protections under Roe. Parental consent does not change. What this proposal does is impact the law from 1931 that bans abortions in almost all cases. So they can throw out any misinformation that they want to, but this restores the same parameters that we had under Roe v. Wade, the federal protections that we had for reproductive access. And parental consent does not change under this measure. Okay, so you're saying... So, so what I would say is that please get the original amendment that they want to make law, and I would ask you to read it, and I would say if you don't understand it, then you need to vote no. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Anthony, would you like to respond to that? I, I, I just simply agree with Darcy. Um, it, it, parentals rights are still, uh, will be, remain, and children will still be able to, you know, have procedures under parental guidance. There's another question from the floor, Mr. Mack. Yes, um, thank you. And I've, I've just been sitting there appreciating the panel. Um, I'll be honest, I have a comment about the language, but I want to be candid about the fact that I have some internal struggles with the whole question of abortion. As a believer in Christ, I feel that I don't favor abortion, but as a civil rights lawyer, I see a real problem with imposing whatever moral compass I have on a woman who may or may not want to make that choice, right? So that's just something beyond it. And, I, and honestly, I think a lot of us in our community have that same internal struggle. And so I just wanted to put that out because I think that what's unfortunate about Proposal 3 in this language is that we're not having that discussion. We're not having the discussion about where we as a state want to go with the question of abortion, but we're talking about language and masseuse is giving abortions to uh, 14 year olds, right, instead of doctors. Um, I will say, pushing back on my be beloved sister Darcy just a bit, I do find some issues with the language in the Article 28, the proposed amendment. Um, in reading it, and I have read it and I've reviewed it, I think what, th yes, there's the one example, it does say individual. Uh, also, it, it talks about uh, state can't penalize and the use of the word someone, close quote, for administering, administering an abortion. Uh, which could mean that could a masseuse read the last statute and say, yes, this could happen? Yes. What I do think practically will happen, I think practically if in fact this passes, we get to a point where common sense takes over, where these commercials, I think they're taking these, these, these issues and this language and they're going way too far with it because none of those are common sense. It's not common sense that any law will allow a masseuse to give an abortion to a 13-year-old. That just doesn't make sense. We do have laws on the books regarding parental consent, guardian consent. We do have laws on the books regarding uh, administration of medical procedures. The argument would be, well, this is the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis these individual state statutes. I think, again, common sense will work that out. Um, I do think, I guess just, you know, finally, it, it is unfortunate that, uh, and I've whoever was the drafters of this provision uh, didn't make it closer to Roe, but, but tried to put some more of this in to where we're now having that discussion instead of a discussion about where we as a state need to go with abortion. I'm gonna allow you to respond to that, Darcy, but then we're gonna do our wrap-ups after this. Sure, so I think ultimately you said that we do have laws about parental consent. We do have regulations uh, as it relates to who can perform an abortion. And so those laws exist and those laws would not change under th this measure. Um, as with any other measure that's on the ballot, there's always sort of the post 
after uh, the measure passes where the branches of government may take action. So that part doesn't change either. But as it relates to the specific proposal, no, a, mas a masseuse is not going to be performing an abortion. Doctors perform abortions. And they have to, it, it's one of the most strictly regulated industries. Licensing requirements are among the most stringent. So those things don't change. It's unfortunate that the opposition has confused people enough to think such <laughs> uh, insane things could happen because this is to avoid the 1931 law. This is to restore the protections that we had under Roe. The alternative, just so we're clear, is a near all out ban, not just on abortions, but all aspects of reproductive care. And that is what the opposition wants. So they can talk about and distract with all this noise, but that is their goal. So if you want to keep the reproductive health care access that we have, keep access to um, reproductive care in those extreme circumstances where it's medically necessary, then you need to vote yes on three. There's not any sort of middle ground here. Uh, we are talking about, that's the extreme side, the 1931 law. Uh, Kevin, before you go on, I was, I, I thought I read in the proposal three that it would allow the state legislature to regulate abortion of a vital, of a, a viable fetus. Did I get that right? Would you like to? You respond? did that. That it does allow for regulation by the state. That is correct. Okay, so right. Once a fetus is viable, then the state can say, "This is it, the right. procedure you've got to follow, if any at all, or no right. procedure." Right. Okay. It it does say at or medically necessary, and that is specific to what I just spoke of. Someone who is pregnant, the baby is not developing properly, and now cannot function there in the fallopian tubes or some other extreme medical state uh, that requires uh, medical intervention. Um, we're gonna go ahead and do our one minute closing. I'm gonna start with you, Ms. Anthony, on the end. Well, I just wanna thank you again. Um, for having me here and speaking on um, such an important matter, but um, I am just outdone that we find ourselves here, you know, um, fighting for the right to decide, you know, what choice to make that is the best for our bodies. And people are taking that right against us, um, from us. Uh, and, and it is ridiculous to me um, but I will continue to press towards the mark and, and, and ensure that we continue to go to doors. We continue to talk to voters about how important it is to make a choice to decide uh, and how important it is to um, vote early, you know, get those absentee ballots early so that you can participate in ensuring that your loved ones and the people who you care about are also gonna vote early. Vote yes on proposal three, yes on proposal two, yes on proposal one. All of these things correlate and will benefit our communities. And I will continue to say this, you know, as long as I'm health and wellness chair, that I'm always gonna, you know, look out for the best health care equity that you know we can we need to hold our legislators accountable for the things that they say they're going to do and remember the things that they don't do that they say they are going to do we need to call them out and we need to make sure that we hold you know ourselves responsible for putting these things in place because if we go back because we didn't go out and vote we have we are to blame for that so um, again, thank you and NAACP for having me here and uh, I would love to come back and you know, argue some more. Ms. <laughs> Kennard, could you please give your one minute closing? I would like to say thank you for having me and I would direct you to reading two articles by two nonpartisan uh, newspapers. The Detroit News did an article. I would suggest that you go read that. It's called um, Reject Extreme Response to abortion, vote no on proposal three. It's an editorial, read that. And also read uh, National Review, 
by Madeline Kearns, and it says Michigan is sleepwalking toward abortion extremists. I have nothing to gain from this. I just want you to all be educated, whether you agree or disagree. It doesn't matter what we say up here, but I'm gonna say, please do your homework. Don't just take what we're saying. Read the amendment. Go and read these other things and get educated, because process of elimination is lack of education. Thank you so very much. Ms. McConnell. I'm also grateful to have this opportunity to speak. I uh, made it in the nick of time today. Thank you. And the reason I did is because I was coming from a church where there were a number of clergy who were standing in support of Proposal 3. And they do talk a lot about the importance of access to reproductive health care. Maybe less about abortion access, but they still understand why we need to support Proposal 3. I'm a mentor Darcy, Auntie Darcy. Um, I can't fathom a world where my nieces, real or play, don't have access to the same health care that I did. And so I think it's critical for them. I think it's critical for us as a group of people to say yes to Proposal 22-3, yes to Proposal 3, so that we can restore those reproductive rights that we've had for 50 years. The alternative is dire. Um, there's a woman today who does some of our clergy outreach, and she had two ectopic pregnancies as part of the reason she's involved. And she put it in very frank terms that, you know, this people are dying or will die. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the mortal, the morbidity rate for black women is the highest, and those numbers will increase. So I can't stress enough how important it is for people to say yes to Proposal 3. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and to your point in my closing, I was going to say that, you know, black women are three times more likely to die in pregnancy for a variety of factors than other uh, races, specifically Caucasian. Um, and this is such a um, strange topic in many ways because it doesn't seem like it's necessary to have politicians discussing things as it relates to health care. But we are here. And we've been here for some time, although there has been 50 years of Roe versus Wade, and now we are here as a result of recent decisions. Um, I appreciate all of you ladies uh, having intelligent discussion. Uh, I think what our country needs more of is people discussing ideas instead of individual. Um, ad hominem attacks or attacks against the individual only lead us to more chaos. And so you all represent it. Uh, and through our George Crockett Community Law School, you represented intelligent discussion. So we appreciate that. So thank you so much for this panel. Thank you for participating. And uh, thank you to everyone online watching. Uh, and by all means, however you feel, please vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to Kevin. Thank you to the panelists. It's been a great opportunity to be here. This is the George W. Crockett Law School, which is part of the Thurgood Marshall Ruth Bader Ginsburg Legal Initiative. We do this because we believe that if people listen to each other, they'll understand each other, and then we won't have as much conflict. I mean, you, 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 you don't have to agree, but you shouldn't be disagreeable. That's the idea. We can all talk to each other and end up living together. So thank you so all so much for being here. Uh, NAACP is a nonpartisan organization, but we do believe in putting all the issues out there. Thank you. Remember, we've got some more things coming up. Um, October 25th, there is the School Board Candidates Fair. Again, we're nonpartisan but there are 18 people who are running for the Detroit School Board. There are only four positions. 14 people are gonna lose. So who should you vote for? That's why you come out and you listen to the candidates talk about their positions so you can know firsthand what they stand for and whether you should spend your vote on them. November the 5th, starting at our headquarters at 8220 2nd Avenue, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. We're gonna have a party at the polls. Lots of activities, prizes, 
meals, etc. And then we're going to march to the Detroit Department of Elections on West Grand Boulevard um, for other activities along with the whole point of voting. Vote, vote, vote. That's what you're always going to hear here. Take your souls to the polls. That's always our thing. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, next Saturday, we will be at the, the offices of the Detroit Bureau, 8220 2nd Avenue at the corner of Seward. We will again be virtual for those who uh, need to catch us on the computer. We'll have many, many more lively discussions. You, you, you will have noticed that people are vested in their positions in this panel discussion. That's good, because we didn't ask anybody to come here today to give up their position, to change their mind. We want you to hear from everybody so you can make an intelligent decision, so that you can make, find your way through the difficult legal issues, and so that you can be informed. Thank you so much. Have a great day.